Hey everybody, happy Friday. It's me, JJ, back again here for another ASUS PC DIY hardware live stream. Um, and uh, got actually a good amount of things to be able to go ahead and kick off this week in terms of being able to introduce you guys to some brand new products. Uh, also, for those of you that are hopefully joining us on Instagram, uh, welcome to the stream. So uh, if you guys are checking us out on Instagram, fantastic. Uh, of course, field of view is gonna be a little bit different. And if you're interested in checking out, of course, the full field of view, uh, you can definitely check us out right now on YouTube, Facebook, as well as Twitter. And of course, you can always check us out on demand. And uh, we also are going to be kicking off our Instagram AMA series, which will be happening every Tuesday. So uh, for those of you checking us out on Instagram, make sure to go ahead and check those out on Tuesdays where we're going to actually be answering your guys' questions. Although we will be doing that a little bit later also in the Q&A today. So um, that wraps up that. So uh, let's go ahead and see who we've got joining us here for the stream. Uh, hey, Erica, thanks so much for joining us to the stream, letting us know that everything's good on the audio side. Uh, hey, Gary, happy to have you here. Um, in terms of anything relative to any RMA, feel free to go ahead and reach out to our service and support team. Uh, this is ASUS North America. So whether you're in the US or in Canada, our um, recommendation would be to either uh, uh, use the My ASUS app, which you can actually go ahead and engage uh, with online via a kind of a mobile app, or you can also do it in Windows. Uh, or if you have your RMA number, you can definitely reach out to our service and support team via uh, the phone number or of course contact us via email. Um, so from there, uh, looks like also we got Geekbench guy back again. Thanks so much for having us here on the stream. Uh, hey, Snef, fantastic. Always, a happy, always happy to have you here on the stream. And uh, Mark, thank you so much also for joining us on the stream today. So uh, let's get ready to go ahead and kick things off today. We've got actually a few new products to be able to talk about, which I'm excited um, in terms of two brand new white monitors, uh, which is going to be a kind of in a continued kind of expansion in terms of our white product portfolio. I know definitely a lot of you have been excited to see us introduce more and more white product offerings. Um, I believe overall, I feel pretty confident that Asus actually has probably one of the broadest white ecosystems out in the market, ranging, of course, from uh, white peripherals to, to monitors, graphics cards, power supplies, chassis, headsets, um, you know, peripherals, laptops, really almost to just about every pr product category. Uh, we generally also now have a white offering. Um, so definitely, I think we we fit the, the bill pretty well. And we're definitely committed to hopefully continue to evolve upon that, even though um, overall, definitely monochrome is still where the, the majority of the kind of volume is in the market. But we've got some monitors to talk about. We've got an update to our uh, PN51 mini PC that we're going to be touching on. The uh, RG Fusion 2 500 gaming headset is getting ready to launch. We'll be go ahead and touching on that guy as well. And also giving you an update on a cool little kind of subtle networking accessory with our RG Ethernet cable for those of you that got 10G enabled setups, but well, we've got something for you if you want to go ahead and kind of uh, take it to a little bit next level when it comes to the aesthetic uh, for um, ROG. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and see what we got going on here in terms of our first update. Uh, first things first, uh, give me one second here to bring up this site. Uh, we actually have a pretty cool um, initiative that's going to be going on, which is really centered around our kind of our, our pro art series. So it's really um, actually a campaign that we're excited to be able to go ahead and kick off in relation to um, allowing kind of the community of creators out there to be able to uh, have a really great opportunity in terms of actually uh, sharing their creations and then being able to win some amazing prizes. So um, give me a second to go ahead and uh, show you actually the website here and I will Go ahead and uh, give you guys a little bit more information about it. And Gary, again, um, you know, feel free to go ahead and reach out to our service and support team. Um, if you want, you can also go ahead and send me your RMA information. Again, if you're in North America, PCDIY at ASUS.com. And I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll forward that to our service and support team. But do keep in mind that when it comes to anything related to an RMA, uh, the process does take time logistically in terms of not only the product being received and inspected by our actually service and support team. Um, and then from there, actually coordinating internally to figure out whether it's a repair, whether that's actually maybe um, uh, um, a CID related incident or any number of other factors relative to inventory, and then they can follow up and help to resolve your issue with you. Um, so uh, with that, let me go ahead and actually bring up here our Pro Artist Awards right here. So you're going to see this is the actual site. Um, there's going to be actually a lot of information that's broken down right here where you can see that uh, it actually started off at the beginning of this month. It'll be actually running all the way until May 15th. So you've got definitely some time to be able to go ahead and submit. And also for those of you out there in the community, we'd love to have you actually be able to vote. And you'll see that in June, we'll actually be announcing the winners. Um, so you can see right here, it says unleash your creativity in all forms. Multiple category entries are allowed with only one submission per category allowed. Uh, you can see that there's opportunities for photography, for graphic design, for film, and for animation. Um, you can see that 
prizing, there's quite a bit of prizing that is going to be available to you right here. So we have actually cash prizing um, that you'll see, as well as Asus uh, Creator Series products, where you can see that we've got everything from laptops to monitors to portable displays to motherboards. So a very wide range of options. So um, you'll see that there's pretty much all broken down here. Um, the voting options, it's all there. You can already see some actually very cool submissions that are present right here. We'd love for you guys to be able to engage upon this. So, so I know that we've got some great already creators here in the stream um, that do some really interesting things. So why don't you go ahead and take a stab? So um, it's a pretty good cool opportunity to be able to go ahead and pick up some amazing hardware while also be able to get some uh, visibility through our platforms. So I'm going to go ahead and share this with you guys. And again, um, this is going to be running until May, OK? So let me go ahead and drop this uh, over into the chat. Okay, fantastic. So that was one of the first big announcements. And again, uh, there is a really big prize incentive that we have gone ahead and enabled there. Um, like I said, I think with a total of $100,000 in terms of actually prizing, um, including, like I said, I believe up to the $60,000 in terms of cash. So there's actually uh, quite a bit there. So really, I, I do recommend that if you have anything relative to the different categories where you can go ahead and uh, submit, take advantage of it, right? And, um, you know, Hopefully, best of luck to you in terms of your submissions. All right, so um, next up, I wanna go ahead and of course talk about some UEFI BIOS updates. Um, as you guys generally know, in the PC DIY group, usually somewhere between Friday to Monday, I will post the PC, uh, PC DIY featured announcement, which will include our UEFI updates for the week. So that's a consolidation of, sense of updates that we have for Intel and AMD based motherboards. And uh, I haven't posted it up yet today. It'll probably be coming a little bit later today, if not like I noted on Monday. Um, not too many updates. Most of the updates uh, for this week are going to be for B660 series. I think there was maybe one or two Z590 that might have been in there. And I think also maybe one or two Z690 series motherboards. Uh, for most of these, are ge they're generally a continuation for I know X570. It's a continuation of the previous 1.2.0.6 six a geisa release and again that is what i would refer to as a minor maintenance release um the amd platform as a whole is quite mature um so generally you, it's not something you necessarily want to rush out and update to as always too i always strongly caution that if your system is already overclocked it's stable it's reliable you have a good operating experience don't update the uefi especially if it contains low level firmware whether that's intel management engine firmware on amd it could be a geisa firmware or chipset firmware the reason being is of course this can contain um a lot of kind of subtle auto rules and other kind of parameters that can affect actually uh, stability. Sometimes people incorrectly assess this as being negative stability improvements when actually what happens more so is it kind of changes in optimizations can require you to actually go back and kind of retune your settings relative to that new kind of baseline. And that's because some of the underlying operating rules have changed, right? So you can't necessarily always expect the same operating parameters to work identically. Um, this is generally less of an issue if you're usually running your system uh, at stock settings. Uh, but again, if you have kind of tightly in uh, tightly set overclocks for your CPU, tightly set overclocks um, for your, your DRAM or you're running some type of RAID configuration or anything like that, that is something that you definitely want to be aware of. Again, uh, those updates will be posted a little bit later in a featured announcement. Uh, there's also a really big FAQ guide. So of course, that'll give you all the information if you're wondering about, you know, how about, uh, how about, to go in the process in terms of updating your board or kind of any other questions you might have, okay? And as always, if you're part of our PC DIY Facebook group, then you can feel free to go ahead and tag me if you've got any questions, and I'll do my best to go ahead and cover you guys in that respect. And while we're talking about the group, uh, let me go ahead and drop a link in the chat. So if anybody has any questions there, um, they can go ahead and drop those in there and feel free to tag me. So give me one second, I will load that up. And also let me just double check if we've got any questions in terms of those uh, updates. Okay, great. Got our link here. And let's go ahead and drop that in there as well. Hey, Connor, <laughs> like always, happy to have you here. And uh, Kevin, I would definitely agree that the ProRide series, it's one of my favorite series. I see it as kind of as an evolution and extension of what we've done previously with our workstation series and our prime series of products. And definitely is a really great option for those of you that are a little bit more kind of into that, of course, professional or prosumer segmentation, focusing on content creation, science and simulation, advanced productivity, right? Um, and aren't necessarily maybe in that gaming camp like we've got with so many of other products like with Tough Gaming, ROG Strix, of course, formal ROG series products. Hey, GP, haven't seen you in a little bit. Thanks so much for joining us here on the stream. 
Okay, so uh, that covers our UEFI BIOS updates uh, for this week. So let's go ahead and get ready to jump into, I think, a couple of just a quick sale and promo announcements that we've got going on. So let me see right here. I think we've got um, a couple of little cool promotions that I just wanted to be able to touch on quickly. So uh, first one, as always, is remember, guys, that we have gone ahead and recently updated our ASUS website, uh, which now features our eShop integration. Um, so this was actually done towards the end of last year, where essentially now you have the opportunity you can purchase directly on the ASUS US web store, where before we used to have to go to the ASUS eStore website. Um, and some people might not even be aware that we actually had uh, some of our products actually offered directly on the ASUS eStore. But one of the additions that we have gone ahead and implemented is a deals and promo section. So I'm going to go ahead and drop in the deals and promo section right now for those of you that may be interested. Let's go ahead and drop that in there. And do keep in mind that these promotions, of course, will change over time. Uh, sometimes you're going to have different promotions at, uh, at different stages. Um, and the promotions can really vary. It can be everything from our systems-related products to, of course, monitors to peripherals to kind of anything in between. Um, I haven't checked it right now, but uh, let's see if we quickly take a look. We can see right now um, for, let's say, our uh, component series of products, we have actually our Tough Gaming VG27AQL1A. It's a really nice, actually, 1440p based monitor. It's um, 1440p, 170 hertz, supports ELMB sync, G sync, um, a nice, actually, level in terms of the sRGB um, color space. And um, the, I think, response time, it's not one millisecond uh, graded gray. I think it's a little bit higher than that because it's an NPRT-based rating. But it's a very solid monitor. You can see $80 off right now. So definitely not a bad promotion. So again, if you're interested in some promos, you can check that out. But uh, with that also, there are two promotions that we have. Um, going on, and I will link those for the e-tailer. One is going to be for the ROG Strix Z690-E. Um, it's bundled with a 12900K for a savings of $91. Uh, so that is a definitely nice promo that's going on right now. So let me go ahead and link that. So if you're interested in actually upgrading to 12th gen um, and really getting that awesome performance, that feature set of, of everything that comes along with Z690, it's got you covered right there. So let me drop that in the chat. So you guys can take a look at that. And for those of you that aren't necessarily uh, ready to kind of make that jump to DDR5, but you still want to jump to maybe 12th gen, we do also have some promotions going on for two DDR4 boards where we've got the Prime Z690-P, and that's going to be uh, paired up, I think, with a 12600K. That's a fantastic combo. And that one's got a $30 savings. So let me drop that one there in the chat. And I think one other one, we also have the Tough Gaming Z690 Plus, which is definitely one of my favorite boards within the Tough Gaming Z690 lineup. And that one is also paired up with the 12600K. And that one actually will be getting you a $52 savings if you get it bundled together. So um, definitely some nice savings. I mean, 52 bucks uh, in itself is enough to put you on it towards a you know decent size little M.2 SSD, put that maybe towards your memory cost, put that towards a cooler, uh, any number of different items. So um, some nice combos right there. So three combos, all the all, all entered in there for you in the chat if you guys are interested. So feel free to go ahead and check those out. All right. So I think that probably wraps it up in terms of any promotions uh, that I wanted to go ahead and touch on. Let me see if you've got any questions right there. So, hey, Jeff, um, just asking, so what are your thoughts on my Asus laptop not showing my HDD or my M.2? Um, that can really actually be quite variable. Um, you know, when you talk about uh, drives generally not being detected, it can really be quite a number of different things. But initially, especially if your HDD is not showing, um, I would probably say it's because the drive has failed or has some type of a fault. Um, this can happen for a number of different reasons. It could maybe be the cantilever, the internal mechanism. It could be the internal PCB board uh, has some type of fault or issue and it's no longer recognized. But generally, if your system is essentially posting and it's not booting into an OS environment or you've gone into the UEFI and you don't see one of those volumes, it's generally an indicator. It's usually not going to be a motherboard fault. It's generally going to be uh, the storage device. Um, so if that is the case, of course, hopefully you have backed up your data. Um, if the unit is still within a warranty period, definitely, of course, we make sure to reach out to our services support team and they can work to go ahead and address that by replacing um, the uh, drive which is no longer of course uh, working and get you back up and running in that respect um, of course if it's out of warranty um, so let's say maybe you've had it a few years no longer under warranty uh, you can pretty easily replace um, a 
a standard two and a half inch or an M.2 base SSD, just go ahead and purchase a new one and pop it in. The one thing that sometimes people don't realize though on a laptop is that for M.2 base SSDs, um, I happen to have a few actually over here. Um, but um, so you have kind of different types of drives. So this right here, this is like an SN, I think this is an SN750. Um, so this is actually a fairly high performance PCIe NVMe based drive. Different actually M.2 SSDs have different types of controllers and some controllers are more suited really towards performance and towards the desktop than they are necessarily towards laptops. And the reason why that can actually be important is you might be actually surprised that the different type of M.2 drive, depending on its power consumption, can actually affect battery life. Um, so depending on kind of what your target usage is, if you tend to use it more like a desktop replacement and you're not really that concerned with battery life, then of course you can go with really um, a very fast drive, right? But if you do want actually better efficient uh, relative to power consumption, then be a little bit mindful of that if you're going to be replacing the drive. So uh, hopefully that helps you out in that regard. Okay. All right. Um, let me see if we got any other quick questions right there. Um, so you're saying both are new. Uh, could it be a BIOS? Generally unlikely. And very rare situations, a UEFI update could address maybe a potential interoperability and compatibility issue, but it's pretty rare. If it's not registering, I would probably say more often than not, usually you haven't installed the volume correctly, or also you're not giving necessarily maybe a complete level information, right? It could be that maybe you actually have installed it, but I've many times seen, seen users don't actually kind of detail the entire experience. Um, so what I mean by that is they install it, they boot into Windows and they don't see the volume. Well, the reason being is that you still have to initialize, partition and format the drive, right? So you would actually want to go to Windows, search, uh, open up disk management. And once you open up disk management, it will then actually prompt you through the steps to initialize, partition and format your volume. So that could also be um, the other factor right there. All right. So uh, let me go ahead and get ready to jump into our next item right here. And let's see if there'll be any questions right there. So let me see, Maverick Zero has got a question here before I go over to the next thing. Hey, I was wondering, is there a solution for getting DDR5 to run at its rated speed using the XMP profile? I'm having an issue getting my G-Skill 6000 kit to run without issues. So this, um, I've covered this actually quite a bit in the past in prior live streams, if you do check them out. Um, uh, to not get too complicated and you know too long in terms of the actual kind of issue here, it's hard without actually having much more information. Uh, but I'm gonna give you a couple of things to keep in mind. One, population and density matter. Um, more often than not, generally when I find uh, users that post issues related to an XMP experience, they generally are not detailing the entire actually setup configuration. So an example right here is here, I've got um, a Z690 series motherboard and it's got two dims. And so I'll have a user tells me, I'm running uh, into a problem is running 6,000 megahertz and they never say that they have four dims. Well, there is actually no XMP memory kit on the market that is rated for 6,000 uh, MT. Um, with a four dim configuration. And that's because there's a limitation with the memory controller. When you talk about actually what speed can be reached relative to memory, there are a few things that are required. One is gonna be the memory controller, which is inside your CPU. Two is gonna be the motherboard itself, its overall design along with its firmware, which some people will define as the UEFI, right? Three, the DDR memory itself, right? The memory and the ICs have actually been tested and validated for those speeds. When you buy the kit of memory, that is validated. The motherboard, especially if you have an ASUS board, is pretty much designed and validated. But what you can't confirm and what you can't guarantee is gonna be the quality of the CPU and the IMC. The base frequency that's guaranteed by Intel is 4,800 uh, MT. Anything after that value is an overclocked value. Now we've tested hundreds of CPU samples and we've generally found that probably over about 80% of CPUs in two dim configuration can comfortably run 56 to around 6,000 MT without any, without any issues. Um, but there will always be a percentage that will actually underperform that. Um, that could mean that maybe a weaker uh, CPU might actually only be able to reach um, 56 um, or maybe 58 as opposed to 6,000. This is not a fault of the motherboard. It's not a fault of the UEFI. It's not even really a fault of the CPU. It's just that it, it's a weaker CPU. It has less margin in it relative to the scaling that's possible. Now, I don't know if maybe you put a little bit more information and confirm whether you have a two dim or four dim configuration, um, that will help to clarify. If you're having two dims, I would say you should have a pretty good likelihood of being able to get to that 6,000 MT value. As long as you're running one of the newer UEFI releases, you should generally be fine. 
But if what you're finding is essentially that your system's not stable, so you enable the XMP and maybe you run into a crash, um, then it might mean that maybe your IMC is more marginal. So in that situation, what you would want to do is clear the CMOS, go into the UBFI, set the XMP profile, and once you set that XMP profile, don't save and exit. You actually would then like go down to the memory divider and drop it down. So drop it down to maybe something like 5600 and see if your system posts. If it does, then from there run a memory test and see if everything is stable and reliable. If everything stable is stable and reliable, then from there go up to the next memory divider and kind of keep going up until you reach the wall of instability. Now, if you really want to try to get to 6000, that's when you can start to maybe fine tune some elements. It might mean maybe increasing uh, certain voltage uh, policies that might help to stabilize the OC, but it's not a guarantee. Again, you're talking about overclock related frequencies and there is no 100% guarantee. An XMP profile is not an assurance that it's actually going to be able to run, especially as you get to higher and higher and higher values. If you want always like 100% level likelihood of running a memory, you actually wanna run closer to that original um, validated specification for memory. So that would be 4,800, which is 100% guaranteed because that's what every single memory controller is designed to run at. 5200 is very, very conservative. 5600 is very conservative. Um, you're pretty much going to probably have almost every CPU run that. And like I said, the majority of CPUs will run 6000. Although, like I said, you will start to see some trail off. If you had 10 CPUs, you wouldn't get every CPU being able to hit that 6000 MP value. So hopefully that gives you a little bit more insight into um, your situation. If you have more questions, feel free to go ahead and join our PCDIY group. I've covered this quite a bit in the group. I've posted multiple uh, points on it. And I actually will have a little bit of a DDR5 primer post that'll go up later next week that will also give some additional uh, kind of insights into that. Um, but hopefully that helps you out. Okay. Um, so let me get ready to go ahead and jump into some of our new products, um, or maybe I'll jump into one more question here. Let me see right here. Tom Henry's got a question right here. He's asking us, on my new ROG Z690-E gaming Wi-Fi, should I add washers under my CPU to decrease the operating temperatures? So this has been kind of been floating around the community. Some people have been doing kind of these hacks and mods to be able to try to improve the overall um, I'd say the, the contact right between the IHS and then from the base plate of your actual cooling solution, I would tell you it's not necessary. Um, the reality is that um, I think that a lot of the media coverage that has talked about thermal, uh, thermal performance on 12th gen series CPUs has done so of course, with valid uh, testing, but I think that for the vast majority of users, not really real world, um, uh, real world parameters that are actually going to affect you uh, resident to temperatures. And what I would mean by that is that um, if you're showing essentially temperatures running, let's say Cinebench for 30 minutes or an hour, it's actually fairly irrelevant because the thermal uh, the thermal load that you generally are placing onto a CPU, even if it's heavily overclocked, um, right? So I'm talking about like 5.3, 5.4, 5.5 gigahertz per core overclocked can be done with a 240 millimeter AIO when you're talking about general desktop usage in gaming. But a lot of people will tell you that's impossible. You can't do that. It's entirely possible. And you can have very manageable temperatures with that without going to extremes in terms of a washer or doing all kinds of other things. But it comes down to the usage. If you find that you're actually heavily utilizing your system with a heavy, heavy multi-thread usage, so I don't know, maybe you're doing heavy batch conversion, you're doing a lot of decompression and compre uh, decompression and compression, you're running a lot of rendering or encoding that's using a lot of your cores, that's going to produce the most thermal load, and you're going to need the best cooling performance possible. In that situation, sure, I, I would say consider it. But if your system is predominantly just used for general productivity use and for gaming, um, you'll find that the actual temperature difference between that scenario and let's say like a quote unquote stress test, the Delta could literally be like 40 degrees, if not more. Um, we actually talked about this a little bit in our overclocking video. So if you're interested in that, make sure to check out our YouTube channel, our AIOC overclocking guide. It'll actually talk to you about kind of understanding the balance of kind of how you really want to evaluate temperatures. Um, because the other thing too, is if you're taking in temperatures into too much of a respect, in a worst case scenario, you could actually be handicapping the overclocking capability of the CPU um, because you might think, well, my CPU is getting too hot. There's no point in overclocking it. And you actually could be leaving hundreds of megahertz on the floor, even giving yourself better performance, right? Um, but at the end of the day, it's really what you feel most comfortable with when it comes to your system. Okay.
All right, so uh, let's go ahead and get ready to jump into some of the uh, new products that we've got here, guys. So uh, we've got a number of new products that we're excited to be able to go ahead and talk about. So let's get ready to jump into some of these guys here. Um, I think first up, uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about the ROG Strix Fusion two 500 set headset so I, I know for some of you if you probably have been checking us out in terms of our uh our cs stream that we had a while back um you will definitely remember our introduction to this pretty cool headset um but let me go ahead and actually bring up the images and i'm going to bring up also the product page here in a moment but let's go ahead and take a quick look at this guy this is a pretty sweet uh, headset. It's got a lot of really cool design and features on it. So this is actually leveraging a lot of the design elements that we've got on our ROG Delta with our Essence drivers. It's got an ESS Sabre quad DAC and AMP built in natively. This is gonna have USB-C connectivity so you can use it on your phone, your laptop, your desktop, your Nintendo Switch, your console. Um, pretty much anything, right? And then from there, you could also uh, take advantage of even still a higher performing, let's say, DAC or AMP if you want to use the 3.5 analog based connection. So you can do both. It's a stereo headset, but is also going to support uh, surround based options. And it's got a very cool overall design aesthetic. One other really cool thing that you're going to see right here is um, this is a headset and uh, you don't see microphone, right? You don't see the normal boom that connects. Now on some of our uh, headsets, we've actually offered a design where the actual headset, excuse me, uh, the microphone detaches. But in this design, the actual mics are integrated in, but they actually are AI based beam forming mics. So that actually means you don't need to worry about positioning or distance or anything because it's just gonna be always in alignment with your mouth. Um, so this creates really, really solid, consistent voice uh, pickup. So this is a very, very cool design that we have in terms of this headset. And then you've got, of course, your cool RGB lighting. You're gonna see you got uncup ear controls where you can go ahead and do a quick mute. You can go ahead and adjust the volume levels. Um, this model does actually have two levels of adjustment for not only game um, uh, uh, audio, uh, but also independent uh, chat. So you can actually go ahead and toggle back and forth and be able to independently adjust uh, the game audio, or you can independently adjust the chat. So that is a pretty cool level of functionality um, also there. And they also, of course, have, of course, that cool fold down design that is going to be present here. And uh, you'll see that they also come with two sets of ear pads, which I'm a really big fan of. This is often overlooked on some of our premium headsets. Not many headsets actually come with two sets. This is very cool because, of course, it gives you the flexibility of going, do you want more isolation and comfort or do you want more breathability, right? So that uh, if you're maybe something that's got a little bit warmer head, longer gaming sections, and you want a little bit less isolation, right, but you want better breathability, then that is something to keep in mind. You can, of course, see that you've got your cables that are included and you're all good to go. So let's go ahead and bring up this product page right here. And uh, we're going to go ahead and take a, even a closer look at this headset. And I think right here, uh, this one is going to be coming in at $179.99. $229 um, is going to be its price point in, uh, for our friends in the north in terms of Canada. So let me go ahead and bring this up right here. All right, so here we go. And I will drop this in the chat as well uh, for those that you want to go ahead and take a look. So um, you can see right here, this is, again, the RG Fusion 2500. Again, that quad DAC and amp. The really cool thing about that quad DAC and amp design too is also going to be that it's going to be very consistent. So normally when you rely on the DAC and amp that's going to be on your laptop or your desktop or your phone or your switch or whatever, you're relying on the audio design in that device. And that can actually be quite different from one device to another. Having the DAC and amp built into the headphone allows us to actually have a far more consistent experience um, across all your devices because all the actual audio processing is all done inside of the headset. Um, this also allows us to tune the DAC and the amp resident to the drivers uh, that are going to be inside the headset as well. So um, I'm a big fan of this type of design, especially when you talk about consistency going from one device to another device. Um, we've got that ROG AI beamforming microphones, which is really cool, along with that noise canceling design. Essentially, what that just means is that the microphone uses our hardware-based chip that's built inside of the headset that will filter out noise. So if you got things like HVAC, you got dogs barking, you've got ambient noise and sounds, you've got clacking from your mechanical keyboard, whatever it might be, pretty much most of that will be all filtered out. So that is really, really cool. And you do also have different levels. You can go ahead and customize the level of AI noise cancellation through our Armory Crate software. Uh, the game chat functionality, of course, that analog and digital-based connectivity, and of course, that nice ASUS or RGB lighting support. So uh, overall, a very cool headset. 
um, that you will have. And for those of you that want some flexibility in terms of kind of virtual surround, you do have a toggle option also with Armory Crate to be able to adjust the EQ, enable a virtual surround and kind of a widening stereo feel if you want to play around with kind of positional tuning um, or kind of the pickup in different types of games, uh, that is also an option. And here you can kind of see a little representation of that uh, beam forming microphone design. Whereas I noted, there's no boom that you have to connect, right? It's all integrated inside of the headset, okay? So pretty cool design. This will be hitting uh, uh, stores uh, probably, I think, by about the end of the month. Right now, we are pretty much getting this in, working to get this actually out, released in terms of distribution. So I would probably say, make sure to keep it tuned uh, to kind of the common e-tailers, and you should probably be seeing it pop online by probably around the end of the month, possibly maybe a little bit earlier, but um, that is overall the time frame we're going to be looking at. And we will also be following this up with a little bit of a lower cost version with the ROG Fusion 300, which will be coming out a little bit later. That one will drop off not having analog. So you'll only have the USB-C, no 3.5, right? You'll still get the quad DAC. You'll still get our Essence Air, uh, drivers, which are very, very nice, tight 50 millimeter drivers um, with our, what's called air airtight chamber design. So it's got really nice, good, solid um, base good mid-range and nice detailing without being too sharp. Um, you can still see RGB lighting is the same. Microphone uh, is pretty much the same right there with the AI noise canceling support. On ear cup is pretty much going to be the same. Um, you'll see though the game chat control, that's going to be different and that is removed, okay? So that is going to be the ROG Fusion 500. Again, that's going to be coming out towards the end of the month, 179.99 and 229 Yes, uh, 229 uh, for our friends over in Canada. Uh, let me see if we've got any uh, questions right there. So Richard is asking, how comfortable is it around the ears? Um, I would say it's going to be pretty clo close to kind of the Delta. Um, they wait. Let me check and see what the Delta uh, difference is here. Um, because clamping force, I can tell you that we have definitely tuned for clamping force so that they're not overtly heavy. But what kind of comfort is around the ears is I would say depends on kind of the weight. So this is going to be a 310 gram. So it's going to be kind of in that class here of what we've got with the RG Delta. So it's going to be a little bit on that heavier side, I'd say, as opposed to something that lighter weight, like maybe our uh, Tough Gaming H series or the even the ROG Delta S, which are going to be quite a bit lighter than this headset. Um, I still find for me, it's definitely fine. I could wear them comfortably for, you know, an hour and a half, two hours, no problem. But, um, you know, that's going to be always a little bit variable between different people. Um, the yoke also that you have in terms of that does allow for the adjustment so that you can go ahead and, you know, Try to make sure that it aligns right with the size of your head so that it doesn't necessarily feel too heavy. Um, the design too also is going to be similar to this in terms of this is considered what's called an over ear. So it's not an on ear. It goes around the ear um, in, in terms of the overall cup design, right? So um, again, depending kind of on your preference, that is going to be something to keep in mind. So hopefully that answers your question right there. Hey, John, these are not a 3D headphone um, because they are essentially stereo, right? So there's only two drivers, right? One driver and then another driver. If you wanted something that was really designed for kind of multi-channel, you could enable the virtual surround or you could take a look at something like our ROG Theta, which is actually a multi-driver headset. It means it actually has, it's designed for like 5.1, 7.1. It's truly designed for um, kind of a more spatially aware kind of audio setup. So if you're looking for kind of a true surround town headphone, then the ROG Theta would be the headphone that you want to take a look at. Okay. Um, I would say I haven't had a final test sample for the um, the Fusion 2, so I don't want to comment 100%. I know that the driver tuning should be pretty similar to the Delta. And actually, Connor, I'll be reaching out to with to you and then I do this in the future. I'm actually working on our team and I'm doing some cross-checking between the most recent um, driver releases. So I actually have, excuse me, all three versions of the firmware release to be able to do some cross-checking to see about some of the feedback you noted, as well as I've tested and our feedback to our team to see about that kind of overall. But I would say that you should expect a similar kind of tuning experience here where I think that it's a very nice quality headset that works well for music, movies, and games. Um, some headsets I feel are a little bit sharper, right? They're a little bit more designed for kind of um, uh, positional kind of a cueing as opposed to kind of having good detailing in terms of low extension, the mid range, and then, you know, nice detailing in terms of your upper frequencies. Um, and that's where I think the fusion along with the Delta really do a good job in that respect. All right. So uh, let's get ready to jump here into our next item.
and that's going to be two monitors that we've got. And these are going to be two white monitors. Um, I think these are going to be pretty awesome. We got the RG Strix XG27AQ and uh, the RG, RG <laughs> excuse me, the RG uh, XG27AQ. This one's going to be coming in at 499 and then 669 uh, Canadian. So again, uh, 499 for US and then a 669 in terms of Canada. Um, and then the second monitor that we're going to be talking about is going to be fairly similar in terms of specifications. We're going to be jumping it up to 32 inches. So let's first go ahead and take a look at um, this guy, the 26 inch model, excuse me, the 27 inch model. And let me bring up the images for this guy here. All right. And this is a great looking monitor. You can see it right here. It's got a really nice, beautiful, clean design aesthetic, right? Um, with, of course, that nice white bezel. And even, of course, the stand is all white and the base is that nice silver with white. This is going to also be compatible with the ROG desk mount, which our ROG desk mount is going to be our C-clamp mount design. So if you don't want to have to have essentially any of your desk taken up by the base, you can essentially put that clamp at the base and that attaches to the actual monitor and you still have ergonomic adjustment because the ergonomic functionality is built into the monitor. It's not at the base, which is just there for stability. So that is very, very cool in terms of that uh, design. Um, as we go ahead and just take a look at connectivity, you'll see that you've got a lot of connectivity right there with two HDMI. That's going to be HDMI 2.0B uh, display port. And then you've got your USB hub, as well as, of course, uh, your uh, 3.5 connection on the back as well. This is going to be also G-Sync compatible on this monitor here. And you'll see, of course, you have our classic kind of joystick dial and on-screen display adjustment options and where they traditionally are on the monitor. A lot of people have uh, fed back that they'd like that overall kind of design that we have there. And then I don't know if I have the rear shot on this monitor uh, to show you the back. Uh, there you go. Um, it does also have the or RGB lighting. You're not going to notice really this because it's at the back of the monitor. But if you probably got it pressed up against the wall a little bit, you'll get a little bit kind of some nice little backfill lighting. Um, it's subtle. It's not that big of a deal. But for those that appreciate it, well, it's there. And of course, you do also have a nice cutout there for your cable routing. So that is going to be this guy. Let's go ahead and take a look at all the uh, elements in terms of your core specifications. And also, as you noted right there, ergonomic are pretty much almost all of the ROG uh, monitors, except for the largest displays. Um, this is a great monitor in terms of giving you ergonomic flexibility. So you can go ahead and make all your adjustments to make it work best to your environment. So let me go ahead and bring up the page here and get this open up for you guys. So give me one second here. And actually, I don't think I dropped in uh, the, let me drop in also the link there for the Fusion 500 that we just talked about. So if anybody has any questions there. So there's uh, for the Fusion 500 and uh, here we're gonna have it also for the XG. So let me drop that in there in a moment. Okay, perfect. Okay, there we go, that's for our XG, okay. And uh, I don't know if that Fusion 500 link went in. So let me go ahead and drop that in one more time. OK, cool. Uh, there we go, 27. Perfect. OK, so here you guys go. You can see uh, you've got 27 inch display, uh, 1440p, so 2560 by 1440. This is a fast IPS based panel that also features our anti reflective based uh, coding design. Um, then you've got overclock support in terms of the refresh rate up to 170 hertz. Uh, default is 144, then one millisecond gray to gray. ELMB Sync, which ELMB Sync essentially is a technology that we have that it helps to improve motion clarity in certain games. Um, the cool thing about ELMB Sync is that it's essentially a backlight strobing implementation, but the cool part about it is that it also works with adaptive sync. Normally, when you put adaptive sync, excuse me, when you enable backlight strobing, you don't get adaptive sync, so you can still have tearing and other kind of things that come into play. But with our design implementation, you can do both. You can still have the backlight strobing, but you can also have uh, adaptive sync at the same time. That's why it's called ELMB sync, okay? G-Sync compatibility, and then display HDR 400. While display HDR 400 is definitely not enough to be able to showcase to you the true kind of experience and the punch and the vibra uh, you know, vibrant nature of what you would expect in something like a uh, display HDR 1000 or better base panel, especially with uh, compared to like our full array local dimming monitors. Um, what I would say is the benefit of going over to a display HDR 400 monitor, especially compared to older monitors, is that you might find that is a, just a brighter punch your based monitor. Um, a 
lot of gamers might be running maybe monitors that are around that 200, 250 nits. So being able to go to a monitor that's rated at, you know, 350, 400 plus nits, um, it's nice in terms of just giving you a nice punchier display. Um, so I appreciate that. So um, here you can kind of see all those core specifications, pretty much everything I ran through. So I'm not going to recap on all those items. Um, it is going to be nice and solid also in terms of the uh, color gamut coverage and sRGB uh, space coverage. You get all, of course, the cool um, optimized kind of gaming modes that we have in terms of shadow boost, game plus, um, flicker free base design, all that good stuff. And one thing that's not going to be noted on here, but I'm a big fan of is going to be our display widget software. So, uh, the cool thing about the display widget software is you can install this. And when you install this on your system, it allow you to control the on-screen display in windows. So the thing I love actually doing with display widget is pairing different kind of profiles in the monitor to different applications or even different games. So if I open up my web browser, I might make certain levels of adjustments in terms of how I want the picture to be rendered. But then if I maybe jump into, you know, um, Forza, right? Or if I was to jump into, you know, uh, Far Cry or I was, you know, Valorant or CSGO, whatever it might be, then you could actually have different presets. And this actually can be quite a bit more convenient than physically having to touch the buttons on a monitor. So it's a really cool level of functionality that not necessarily everybody's using or even aware of sometimes when they get our monitors. So it is something to kind of keep in mind. So um, that is going to be coming out in the not too distant future. Um, hopefully, again, by the end of this month, you should probably see that one pop up online. So let me see if we got any questions before we get into the next monitor with the uh, PG329QW, which will be essentially a little bit of a bigger monitor, um, but very similar specifications. Hey, uh, so John's asking, do we have a 60% keyboard? Um, the smallest keyboard that we make is this guy right here, which is going to be the RG Falchion. So technically it's a 65%, but it's quite compact. Um, we have it with our Cherry MX, as well as our ROG NX base switches. It's a really cool design in terms that it's got a USB-C um, cable that you can go ahead and utilize, or you can also utilize the 2.4 gigahertz low latency wireless connection. It also actually has an integrated media um, control uh, panel right here on the side that you can actually customize with macros for volume adjustment for different options. It has onboard memory. Um, it doesn't come with these keycaps. I've changed, I swapped out these uh, two pudding, pudding keycaps. It comes with a different set of keycaps on it, um, but I'm a big fan of this if you're looking for something that's gonna be a little bit uh, more on that compact side um, for a kind of travel friendly keyboard. And I don't know if I have the lid for it, um, but this one also, one really cool thing is compared to many smaller keyboards, it actually comes with a case. Um, so the case is actually a little top cover that you can use to protect it if you're traveling it around with it. So nothing gets on the inside of the keyboard and you can actually then dock into it. Um, and that gives it kind of like a little cool, like diffused lighting uh, design when you uh, actually dock the bottom of the case into it. So that is the RG Falchion. Um, so let me see here. Any other questions before I get ready to go into that PG? Uh, yes, Geekbench remembers that we did do a little bit of a teaser for some upcoming maybe wireless keyboards. I can't talk too much about it, but rest assured, definitely in an upcoming PC DIY live stream, we're going to be talking about it in the not too distant future. So make sure to go ahead and stay tuned. Um, hey, Richard, if you ask a little bit more um, to help me understand what it is you're wondering about, I can definitely try to give a little bit more information. Can you, as far as, could you explain a little bit more of the IPS on the monitor? So pretty much, um, if you're not familiar, what we're talking about, essentially, when I say IPS panel or fast IPS, essentially, that is the panel that is used to, to render everything on the screen. There are different types of panels. So you have things like a VA panel, um, you have an IPS panel, you have TN-based panels. So different panels sometimes are suited towards different types of experiences. Um, IPS panels have come to generally be known for being generally very good in terms of their um, direct viewing and off access viewing, as well as also offering very good color gamut and color reproduction. Um, with the latest generation of IPS panels, they also can offer very comparable response speed. So essentially how fast that response time is. Historically, TN panels have usually been the fastest. So for people that want it always kind of like the fastest display for the best motion clarity and the best response and input lag, they would usually go with the TN. But in the last two years, we've seen a lot of improvements within VA and also within IPS. Um, so there's quite a number of different factors that kind of play into it. It depends really on what you're talking about, like what type of technology or feature or functionality you want. But 
Uh, I'd say IPS right now is doing a very good job at giving you a really good balance of kind of all the things that people are looking for. So looking for a high refresh rate, good color performance, uh, bright base display, right? Um, refresh and response, right? That is all kind of view in viewing angles. The only area that you might notice something uh, that I would say is can be a little bit more measurably different. It's going to be something called contrast. VA panels can still generally offer a little bit better overall contrast than you would see on IPS-based displays. And for most people, this is not going to be something they generally notice, but where it can be sometimes a little bit noticeable is in some of the higher performing monitors um, that have higher HDR performance level, because when you have like a really bright to a dark zone kind of on a monitor, this can create kind of haloing or blooming. And when you have more contrast, you can get a smoother experience in terms of how that looks. And IPS doesn't necessarily have the same contrast that you would have with VA, which sometimes can make that look a little bit cleaner um, and a little bit smoother. All right, so hopefully that helps you out uh, there. So let's go ahead and jump into the PG3 uh, 329Q. And then I will also go ahead and make sure to double check if we've got any other questions there. So feel free, of course. And again, let me know. So um, I'm not going to show the images for this one. This one's pretty much the same. It looks almost exactly the same, except it's going to be just a 32 inch version. But let's go ahead and take a look here at the product page for this guy. And you will see, again, we've got the RG Swift PG329Q. And that dash W is important because we have the same exact monitor, but just not in white, right? And now this will be in white. So you can see 32 inches, again, 2560 by 1440. So that 1440 is really a sweet spot. It's gonna do really, really great to be able to be driven by so many different types of graphics cards, so many different games. And also if you're running at 1080p, 1440p is a huge upgrade at just giving you so much more usable space in terms of your desktop. Um, I love a 1440p. I'm also a big fan of 4K, but 1440p is a really nice balance between giving you sharpness and improved kind of just space when you're working in Windows, um, but also giving you a bit more immersion and expansiveness uh, when you're gaming as well. Uh, you can also see fast IPS up to 175 hertz overclocked. A one millisecond gray to gray, so a vast panel, uh, the ELMB technology, and an upgrade. We move over to Display HDR 600. So again, while not as impressive as what you would see like on our highest performing HDR monitors that have like 1,000 or even 1,400 nits, um, 600 is again going to give you a bit more punch. And I will say in some games can actually even offer a noticeable kind of like cool level of kind of pop and saturation. Um, so if you jump into something like Battlefield, if you were to jump in something like Overwatch, if you're to jump into Forza, Destiny, um, Control, uh, Cyberpunk, these are some really great games that you just kind of will notice a nice bit more punch and dynamics uh, that you experience in the overall game. Um, so it is a cool implementation that I think can add value, but most of the time you're going to definitely be running the monitor in an SDR environment, not in an HDR environment, right? Um, so overall, the rest of the specifications are pretty much similar here. Again, you step up to 32 inches, 2560 by 1440, and pretty much all those specs are gonna be the same as what I noted uh, with the prior 27 inch model, right? Uh, with probably the biggest update being from that HDR 400 to the HDR 600, still all the same game modes. And also with the connectivity, pretty much the same here too, right? HDMI, HDMI, display port, that USB hub, and then also that 3.5 millimeter connection. Okay. And this one will be coming out a little bit later. I don't know if the time frame for this one will be before the end of Q1. It might be maybe a little bit closer to Q2, early Q2 time frame, but make sure to keep it tuned here to our streams and to the PCDIY uh, group, as well as our product release calendar, where I'll make updates in that to let you know essentially when this product is getting ready to ship out to the channel if you're interested in upgrading to a white monitor. So let me also go ahead and drop this one in the chat as well. All right, so dropping this in the chat. Uh, so let's see right here. What is the best PC at ROG? Hey, John, um, I'm not sure if you're asking about a laptop, right? Or are you talking about a specific component? If you can give me a little bit more context, that would be great. I'll try to go ahead and see if I can give you a response in that regard. 
Hey, John, fantastic, man. I have five ASUS monitors and I've had ASUS monitors since 2005 and I'll never use another ASUS, uh, excuse me, I'll never use another brand of monitor, man. Thank you so much for your support. And actually, if you're interested, we're going to be launching um, um, our ASUS monitor spotlight, which is going to be kind of supplementary to our PCDI web builder spotlight, where we show people's builds, but we're also going to be showing people's monitor setup. So if you're interested, you can actually submit to have your monitor setup actually shown off here on the stream. So I would love to have you actually submit that, man. So thanks so much for your support. Uh, over the years. And uh, something that some of you might not be aware of is that I know that there's been a lot of fans uh, sometimes from some other competitors and make panels. But one thing sometimes you might not be aware about is take a look at the warranty difference. Um, I can tell you that an example is that LG and Samsung currently on their gaming based monitors only offer a one year warranty. Asus offers a three year warranty on all of its gaming monitors. Um, to me, that's a pretty big difference, especially as you start to get into a more expensive monitor where you might be spending, you know, 500, 600, 700, a thousand dollars on a monitor. I like to know that sometimes I'm having a little bit longer coverage uh, when it comes to the overall monitor. Okay. Um, there's also even factors like we openly disclose our zero bright dot policy, while um, Samsung doesn't even offer a official zero bright dot policy uh, level of coverage. So there are kind of subtle things that it's not sometimes always just about the specifications. There are other things to kind of keep in mind. So something that you might want to be aware of. Hey, Tom, um, do you have any OLED, uh, OLED monitors? Um, not right now, but we have already made announcements. We will actually have two OLED monitors that will be coming out later this year under the ROG Swift line. So we will actually have a 42-inch and we'll have a 48-inch. And we also actually have some portable OLED displays that will be coming out um, in the not too distant future. So we have gone ahead and actually talked about those in some prior streams. So if you're interested in either one of those, make sure to just check out some of the on-demand on streams and you can definitely find out about uh, those upcoming OLED displays. All right, um, let me see. Hey, Connor, uh, display widget sounds great. Does that work on ASUS, on all ASUS monitors? It does not because it actually requires a specific hardware chip to be built into the monitor. Not all monitors will actually support display widget. Sadly, um, this is a, a kind of a limitation based on the kind of the controller that's built into the monitor. And take, for instance, like G-Sync monitors, any of our PG series monitors that have an official G-Sync module uh, has an FPGA chip can't support display widget because they actually use that G-Sync module, which requires an entirely different type of firmware and kind of software design implementation. So those monitors don't offer display widget. So you'll generally only find, only find display widget like on our Tough Gaming series and on our um, ROG, PG, and XG series monitors um, that don't feature the native NVIDIA G-Sync implementation, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and... Uh... Keep moving this along to the next uh, item right here. So next one is going to be the PN51 S1. This is going to be a pretty cool little update that we've got in terms of um, a mini PC. So I went ahead and touched on these in the not too distant past. Uh, for those of you that might remember, um, I think around maybe around CES timeframe, something like that. Uh, but this is a really cool small form factor, ultra compact mini PC. It's literally just maybe a little bit bigger than this microphone right here. It's very, very compact, but it features the Ryzen 5000U series um, CPU uh, built in here. So you can literally get this all the way up to um, a configuration that will offer eight cores and 16 threads with integrated uh, Vega Radeon based graphics. Um, now, of course, that's not gonna offer you the highest level of gaming performance for but, but for general desktop productivity, acceleration, for like a photo editing application, for some video editing, and even for some basic gaming, you can definitely do that. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of a lot of indie gaming, you know, so like roguelite, metrovania type games, all that type of stuff. Um, and like I said, maybe game engines that are not necessarily the newest, but still fun and enjoyable, you could definitely still run on this type of system. So um, you got definitely quite a bit of processing uh, power, really good solid connectivity with USB 10 gigabits, uh, type A, type C, and uh, Wi-Fi 6, as well as 2.5 gigabit LAN built on board and the support for two storage drives. So a 2.5 inch drive, or a PCIe NVMe M.2 base SSD. So let's go ahead and take a look right here. Uh, you'll see the design, it's nice, compact. That's of course where it's all set up in terms for the airflow based characteristics. You'll see the rear connection right here. You can support multiple display outputs. So display output via that HDMI, display output via that DP. You then have, uh, of course, 
uh, your 2.5 gigabit LAN, then you've got more USB right here, and then of course your DC barrel jack connection, and you're good to go. So quite a bit of connectivity for this little small form factor guy. It does also allow for Visa mounting, so you can literally pack this right on the back of a monitor and you would be good to go. Nice, really easy design to be able to access the ability to drop in the 2.5 inch drive or drop in the PCIe NVMe uh, SSD as well as your memory. So that is what you're gonna be adding into the unit is going to be memory and your storage. Everything else will come based on the bundle that you essentially purchase in terms of the CPU configuration. So this is gonna be the PN51S1. And uh, let me go ahead and give you the prices and the configuration. Uh, for this model, and I will also go ahead and drop it in the chat. So give me one second here and uh, bring up the page for this guy. So I'm, I'll drop this in the chat here. Okay, so this is going to be for the PN51, and um, looks like price for the 5300U is going to be 319 then for the uh, 5500U is going to be 429, and then for the 5700U is going to be 599. So it uh, just kind of comes down to whatever the configuration is that you're gonna um, prefer in terms of that um, GPU configuration, excuse me, that CPU uh, configuration. So with the, let's say, take, take for instance, the Ryzen 3 5300, um, that is going to be, I think, four core and eight threads. Right, and then the next part is I think going to be six cores and twelve threads, and then the last one would be eight cores and sixteen threads. So quite a bit in terms of options, in terms of what you would have available to you for that five, Ryzen five thousand U series uh, processor. Okay, so uh, let me go ahead and just bring up that site quickly here, so you can actually kind of quickly just see a little bit of a comparison for that model. And here you guys can check it out. And so you can see uh, it's quite compact in terms of its overall design. You can kind of see it set up right there in relation to the kind of keyboard and mouse. Very power efficient. You're literally talking, I think it's like sub, I think it's sub eight, wa eight watts. It might even be less than five watts actually at idle. So it's very, very power efficient at idle. Um, you can, and like I said, quite robust in terms of its overall connectivity, multi display support. Um, and the performance it offers with that essentially pretty modern uh, Ryzen mobile series processor that's built in. So you can see the dimensions right there. Easy access to be able to go ahead and implement the M.2 or the SATA base SSD. Uh, the connectivity that you have available to you right there. And yeah, I was right. Uh, 7.3 watts at idle, so less than 8 watts. So cool little unit. And again, uh, range between 319 all the way up to 599, ultimately just depending on the configuration that you're going to be looking at. Okay. All right. So that, uh, let me see if we got any questions there before we get over to our next product right here. Yeah, so it's a little bit more than five watts, but it's quite power efficient. Um, you know, some people ask, like, what would I do with this? Well, you can do a lot of little cool things with it. You could actually have this set up as like a little storage server um, so that if you actually wanted to kind of copy over, let's say, your uh, photos, if music files, things like that, and you wanted to put in like a large, you know, SATA drive in there and then an M.2 drive, you could do that. If you want to have just like a nice little basic uh, internet system that's maybe connected to a nice monitor, you could also do it that way. There's a lot of different ways that you could set this up. You could actually run custom OS distributions on there, whether maybe you actually want to run a Linux uh, distribution. Maybe you actually want to run something like um, Chrome OS actually on that. There's actually now kind of third-party Chrome OS distributions that you can actually run on Intel and AMD hardware, which is kind of interesting. So there's a lot of kind of different options in terms of what you could ultimately do with this type of small form factor system. Hey, Tom T is asking, so what monitors would you use with that computer? I would probably go with something like an RVG series lineup. Um, our VG series is kind of our price balance kind of models. We have some really nice units that, you know, they're not super expensive that you can get like a nice 1080p based monitor with a thin bezel, right, um, that you could go with. 
We also, depending on the model of the PN uh, series, there's ones that actually can provide um, you know, the display signal through the USB-C cable. So you don't actually have to have like two different cables. You could just have the USB-C cable that could run and directly go ahead and connect to the monitor. So there's a couple of different models that we have really in our lineup that would be able, I think, work well. I think it just comes down to what's the resolution that you're kind of looking for, right? Do you want some, do you want 1080p? Do you want 1440p? Or do you even want 4K? But that's the cool thing is that PN50, that little unit could run any one of those monitor configurations or even run multi-monitor configurations, right? Yeah, Raphael makes a good point. You could put something like a Kodi on here if you wanted to do something like a little streaming box. If you wanted to set this up and maybe, you know, maybe have it be like a little YouTube TV box or maybe for video on demand services, that's also something you could go ahead and do. So Stanley, uh, you make an interesting point here. So my three AMD motherboard were hot. So you kind of have to keep in mind, these are actually using mobile CPU parts. They're not using desktop CPU parts. So um, the kind of the wattage and the power envelope considerations are very different, right? So like on a desktop, you're probably going to be sometimes talking about four to five times more power, right? That that CPU is using as compared to what you might be offering here. But here there's a nice balance of offering you still high performance, but in a much lower power envelope and also quieter operation with lower power consumption. So that's a kind of really big difference in terms of kind of how these units have been set up and designed here. All right. So uh, let's go ahead and get over to one of our last products right here, which is going to be um, the ROG Cat7 cable. Um, so this is a little bit kind of a niche offering right here, but uh, it is something that we are going to be releasing. Um, so let me go ahead and show it to you guys right here. You'll see it right there. There it is. It's the ROG uh, series cable. So this has kind of been designed to be able to be paired with, of course, some of our 10G enabled products. So we have routers like the ROG AX11000, uh, the RT89AX, right? Our, our 10G switch, our motherboards with 10G. We have different products that have 10G enabled. So if you're kind of living that ROG 10G lifestyle and you want to also have an ROG 10 10G Ethernet cable, well, we've got you covered. You can go ahead and pair those together and you can have essentially that assured experience in terms of maximizing that uh, that experience. Now, keep in mind, of course, it's critical that for you to take advantage of the speed, you do need to pair this with um, a actual 10G enabled router. So again, so some routers that we offer, take for instance with 10G would be like the RG Rapture, the GTAX 11000 would be a model. We also have the RTAX89X, um, is also going to have 10G networking. So you can take a look at different models that we have within the lineup. Um, but if you don't have a 10G enabled product, there's no reason for you to consider this. So do keep that in mind. This is really going to be focused at users that are just looking to be able to take advantage of that 10G networking experience. Okay. And uh, pricing on that uh, cable is going to be, I believe, $29.99 and then $39.99 for our friends up north in Canada. All right. So let me go ahead and uh, just put those last here in chat, make sure that everybody's got access to those guys right there. Okay, and I'll also put those 10G routers in there as well if anybody's got any questions on that side. And uh, before we get over to the PC DIY Builder Spotlight, we've got some questions from Instagram that we're gonna be answering here. So I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at some of the questions that we've got to answer from Instagram, as well as if anybody's got any questions there on down there in the chat, then we'll also look to be uh, answering your questions there too. Right, give me one second here, guys. Let me make sure that I've got all my questions loaded up here. All right. Very cool. So let me see right here. Hey, Zen, um, you know, it really depends on the different GPU, you know, um, budget is always going to be dependent on different users, right? We have users that are, of course, posting every day different types of system builds. But in terms of kind of seeing, I, I think, um, you know, prices continue to come down. That's something that I can't really comment on because there's so many different factors that affect pricing resident to logistics, production, and so many other kind of aspects in mind. Um, you know, the best thing that I can tell you is that, you know, hopefully as the situation continues to improve, you see Im improvements in that respect. So, you know, just continue to watch your respective kind of e-tailers uh, for the di different GPU that you're looking at in that segment. And hopefully you'll be able to find uh, one that aligns with the budget that you have um, in terms of that card. Um, I will also note, of course, we do offer a very big product portfolio in terms of our cards. So um, our kind of entry level series would be in the Phoenix class of cards. And then that moves up to our Turbo series. 
We then have our KO series and then our dual series. And then our highest end series would be the tough gaming series, the ROG Strix, and then ROG Strix LC series. So depending at where you are kind of in the budget, you can take a look at different cards that we're going to have that also feature different price points. Okay. Let me see there if we got any other uh, questions. Uh, oh, hey, Michael, that's a good question there. Uh, what's the length on the cable? Let me actually, <laughs> I did not double check that. Let me go ahead and check right here. Give me one second here. Mm. That cable length is going to be, let's see here. Uh, looks like we have two uh, options uh, in terms of the cable length, uh, but I think it's actually going to be for the, I think that's going to be probably, I think just a little bit short of it. It's a three meter cable. So that should be something like about, almost about 10 feet. I think something like that. Uh, yes, that should be for the 10 footer. Okay. Approximate 10 footer. <laughs> okay. It is not uh, RGV. Okay. So I think that hopefully covers there all those questions right there. Okay, so let's get ready to go ahead and uh, take a look at just some questions that we've got here um, from our friends over at Instagram. So let's go ahead and take a look. Give me one second to go ahead and load this uh, first question up here. All right, so first question is going to be from uh, Hype Hippie Cultivation 3 is I have an ROG Strix 3070 um, and a X570-E Gaming 2, and should I get a Ryzen 5900? So that's actually a very nice combination in terms of your motherboard and graphics card. Um, 5900 is a great processor, but I don't think that there's any reason to jump all the way up to a 5900 unless you're doing a lot of... Um, I would say a heavy load, right? Multi-threaded application workflows. So if you're doing, you know, a lot of video editing and coding, decompression, compression, science and simulation, then maybe that can benefit to you. There are a few games that do have very, very good um, multi-threaded balancing. So Civ is actually pretty good. Um, you'll find a lot of the actual Total War series of games are actually actually pretty well distributed across actually a wide number of threads and actually scale even in relative to performance that the best performances with CPUs that even have more threads. But historically, most games are generally going to be in that sweet spot of that four to about eight thread balance. And then it's going to be all about frequency. In that regard, I think that you'd be better off looking at something like a 56 um, 100X, something like that. It's a fantastic processor, good number of threads that will still give you extra threads compared to the standard. You could then um, still have extra headroom for being able to push it via PBO and kind of tuning it. It's less cooling demands um, and it's going to be lower in price point. And I think a really great all around processor for this type of build. So my recommendation would be probably not to jump all the way up to a 5,900. I'd probably look at a 56, but if you're doing a lot of work and you can justify the 5,900, then of course it will definitely work with that. And one really cool thing about the X570 Dashy uh, Gaming 2 board, is that board has our dynamic OC switcher 2 technology, which is a really cool feature that allows you to have two different kind of overclock profiles. You can set it to do kind of a, a maximum all core overclock. And then you could also have a tuned kind of a per core overclock that you could have set up and it dynamically switches based on the application. So it's a really cool feature that used to be only on our highest end ROG Crosshair motherboards, but now is available on that motherboard. So it might be something you want to check out. So hopefully that answers your question there. Let's go ahead and take a look at our next question here from uh, Smooth. I believe smooth bark is that is that what it is? All right, so uh, smooth bark says, let's see here. Uh, smooth bark is asking, what's the most important thing in my gaming PC? Um, I would say the most important thing in terms of a gaming PC is probably going to be the graphics card. I mean, um, you know, there's a lot of different things that come into play when you talk about uh, importance. But if you're really talking about that, you're on a, you know, you have a certain budget in play, and you you want to really try to maximize the overall experience. The graphics card is really going to be the most determining factor of overall performance for your system. Um, the CPU does play a part, and I see a lot of people always concerned. I don't want a bottleneck. I don't want a bottleneck. 
it's not really that legitimate an issue. Um, you could buy something like a 10400, you know, Intel part, right? Um, um, compared to even something like 12900K, and they're not that far off in terms of performance. For sure, the 12900K, 12600K um, is going to provide much, much faster performance. And now with the 12th gen, 12400K is an outstanding part. But if you actually use that as an example, the 12400K is almost offering almost identical general gaming performance in most scenarios as kind of those higher end CPUs. Um, there, of course, are going to be benefits that the absolute best performance, especially when you talk about kind of minimum and to some degree averages. Right. But it's generally not that much. So you can definitely get very, very high in gaming performance with a much more entry CPU uh, than if you were to kind of flip that around and you got a very high end CPU, but you had a much more mid range graphics card. Right. So in that regard, really, the most important component is going to be the graphics card. After that, I would probably say is your storage. It doesn't mean to go crazy and buy even a PCI Gen 4 SSD. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, standard SATA drives and standard PCI NVMe drives are more than sufficient. But I do recommend an SSD just because um, the experience at loading up games, patches, um, overall responsiveness is so much better than, of course, a mechanical drive. But SSDs have pretty much become standard even in entry-level builds. So that should pretty much be a no-brainer. Beyond that... Um, you know, everything else really comes down to kind of just preferences, right? Even cooling, you don't even need really AIO coolers. Uh, you could comfortably get away with just a good quality tower heat sink and a lot of builds. They're quality, reliable, low cost, and they will work great. So um, yeah, hopefully that gives you um, some insight there in terms of your question right there. All right. So let's go ahead and uh, go to our next question right here. Let me see here. So this is going to be a question right here from Arjun uh, M. Uh, when can we see some uh, Asus ROG ultrawide monitors? Well, we've already got ultrawide monitors. We actually have a, quite a number of uh, ultrawides. So we've got um, a 49-inch ultrawide. We have a 35-inch ultrawide. Uh, we've got a, a, a few different actually ultrawide options. We've got, a, I think, a 38-inch ultrawide. So... There's a 34 inch ultra wide that's in a tough gaming lineup. So we've got tough gaming and ROG series uh, units. Just make sure to check out actually our product page. Uh, we've actually got a good mix of different options that are available in terms of ultra wide based offerings. Um, you know, still ultra wide, while it's become, I think, more popular really kind of depends on the dimensions, right? What you'll generally find is I feel that most people are usually going up to kind of usually about 32, 34 inches usually still prefer flat base displays, right? And then as you move generally up beyond that, that's sometimes when there's a little bit more of a preference to not only maybe an ultra wide, but also a curved um, base display, right? Um, so it's not, not generally going to be as common when you get down to, let's say, a smaller size. So something like a 27 inch base display. But as you get into, let's say, some larger displays, then that's where you'll generally find um, I think interest in uh, an ultra wide based monitor. And that's also where we do have offerings. So Hopefully that answers your question there. And I will check right now in a moment, guys, if anybody has left uh, any general comments in our chat. So give me one second here. Just answer uh, one other question right here. So here we've got something from Razon Gamer. Which power supply is better in ROG Platinum and ROG Titanium power supply? Um, you know, better is kind of a difficult term, right? Because a lot of people will say better or best. Sure, technically, titanium would be superior to platinum, but the reality is, is that they're both going to be outstanding. And perceptually, you probably wouldn't notice a difference between like a Thor one, a Thor version one and then a Thor version two. So one that would be platinum and then one would be titanium. The overall experience is pretty much going to be parity. Um, what I think comes down to being more important, right, is making sure you pick the right wattage resident to your system configuration, right? So if you're overclocking your CPU and your GPU, you've got a lot of RGB, you've got a lot of supplemental components, make sure that you're accounting for that extra buffer, right? Um, some That's a point of confusion a lot of times when people are kind of picking a power supply is you don't realize just by overclocking your processor or your graphics card, you could easily add like another 200 watts of power consumption to your system, right? So if instead of maybe going with like that 650 watt, maybe you should be going to that 850 watt. Or if you were targeting 850 watt, you should go to 1,000. But I will say that generally for almost 90% of probably users, there's probably very rare cases that they need to exceed a 1,000 watt power supply. For most enthusiasts, 850 watt to 1,000 watt is more than sufficient. And I would probably say for like 70% of builds, even um, 
a 750 watt and a 650 watt are actually more than enough, right? But overclocking can, like I said, add a considerable increase in terms of wattage, and especially with higher end components like certain power, uh, like certain graphics cards and CPUs, they actually have what's called peak power requirements. So that means that while they might not generally use that at load, they can ask for an extremely high peak amount of power. And in some scenarios, that can be important in terms of kind of giving you the best experience and stability is having that headroom to account for that peak power request. Okay. Uh, let's see if we got any questions that have popped up right here. Hey, uh, so Tom T is asking us here, let me um, see right here. Do you find multiple motherboards are confusing too many types of motherboards uh, for too many people? You know, that is definitely a challenge. I've been, you know, working with ASUS for more than 15 years um, and I've helped to kind of design and develop many different boards with different parts of our team. And, you know, now we have five different series. We've got Prime series, we have Tough Gaming series, we have Pro Art series. We also actually have WS and then we have ROG, two versions of ROG, ROG Strix and ROG. And there can be confusion, but the reality is that PC DIY is a, an enthusiast hobby segment, right? And you can't make one motherboard that works well for everybody, whether it comes down to features, functions, pricing, or even aesthetics. Some people only want a white motherboard and other people are totally fine with a monochrome motherboard. And then other people don't want as much maybe lighting on a motherboard. And then some people want water cooling headers and then other people don't. And then some people want, you know, up to 5M.2 on motherboard and some people want 10G and Thunderbolt and others don't care about Thunderbolt and 10G. So you have to have a lot of options. Um, that being noted, we do spend a lot of effort to really try to design and develop boards that have a very strong balanced set of specifications that work well for a broad set of users and current key segments. Um, I usually always recommend to a lot of people like three models that I think fit probably like 70% of users. Our ROG uh, Strix, um, usually our Dash E model or Dash F, the Tough Gaming Plus model, and then the Prime Dash A model. Those three models probably for 70% of people will probably work really, really well. And then for the enthusiast segment, um, similarly, I always recommend the Hero. The Hero is going to be like a benchmark board at really giving you an outstanding experience for a true enthusiast that really wants rich features, functions, specifications, connectivity, and like aesthetic design. So hopefully that helps there. Uh, hey, Velvet Diamond, let's see right here. We got a question right here. Do you still plan to support DDR4 for Raptor Lake on Z790? Uh, so I can't tell you about anything that may under be under NDA or under potentially design and development. Uh, we don't discuss products that may under be design and development or future products or portfolios. Um, I can tell you that as soon as we can talk about things, we have in-depth live streams where we detail all our functions, our features, and design implementations. So in terms of what we may design in the future, I can't comment on that. So all I can tell you is make sure to keep it tuned to the PCDIY channel. Make sure to keep it tuned to our PCDIY group, which I always give the latest updates on product features, functions, designs in that group first and foremost. So if you're interested in that, then that's where you're going to find out about it first. Um, as far as for DDR4, of course, we do have DDR4 options right now for Z690 along with DDR5. But the reality is, is that when we talk about really what is going to be the best experience and where the future is, it is in DDR5. DDR5 offers higher densities, higher frequency, um, and overall a superior experience when it comes to an overall platform. Because as we're moving forward to more cores, cores really align with bandwidth. And that's one of the key strengths of what DDR5 has to offer. So um, as the industry continues to mature and enhance production, we're gonna see even more and more DDR5, especially not only within the desktop space, but also critically within the laptop space where it's also more efficient um, because they can operate at lower voltages. So, um, you know, as we move forward, you're really gonna probably continue to see more and more DDR5. Okay, um, see any questions right there? All right, um, let me see right here. I got one last question before we get into the PC Daddy Web Builder Spotlight. So let's go ahead and jump into this. Uh, give me one second here. All right, let's see. So this is going to be from Huswain Kiment. Sorry, which ROG motherboard has the most M.2 slots? Um, so well, technically, we have multiple motherboards that could support up to five M.2 SSDs. But the reality is, I don't know, I think 
too many people focus on M.2. Um, I work with a lot with our team to spec the boards really heavy this year to try to get as lot many M.2, M.2 slots because a lot of people just favor them. But the reality is most users just don't benefit from the ultra high speeds of PCI Gen 4 uh, NVMe M.2 base SSDs. They're generally doing workloads that are generally operating underneath the SATA um, bandwidth marker. And so keep in mind that your motherboard has, you know, four, six SATA ports as well. Um, but, you know, some people just like it from the simplicity. There's no cables. You can just pop it in there and you're good to go. So if that's what you like, definitely, you know, go for it. We've got motherboards that, like I said, commonly will support between three to four to up to five. And if you even want more, we make the Asus Hyper M.2 expansion card, which gives you four more slots, which you can slot into a PCIe slot on a motherboard. So you could actually have a motherboard where you could run, um, you know, the three that you have on there and then add in a Hyper M.2 card and then have seven, right? So you can really add in a lot of M.2 into a system. It just depends on what you're going to have in terms of, you know, how you're using your slots, what your system configurations are going to be and, and kind of things along those lines. Um, and especially if you move into the HED T platform uh, where you have a lot more PCIe lanes than even what you have on, let's say, mainstream series chipsets, you could run multiple Hyper M.2 cards. So you could literally run like two and you could have eight M.2 just via two Hyper M.2 add-in cards. Uh, let me see if I've got an image right here of the Hyper M.2 card. Um, and then from there, I think, guys, we're going to get ready to kick off into the um, PC Diary Builder Spotlight and look at some cool uh, PC builds, right? Let me see right here. What do I have? I don't know if I have any images right now of the Hyper M.2 card saved in my system. I uh, don't think I have it right here, so I think we're okay. Although I could actually, I could actually, let me see if I can just bring it up right here quickly. <clears throat> uh, Asus. Hyper M.2. There you go. All right. We got to br bring it up for you. That's the power of the internet, right, guys? <laughs> so here you can see this is the um, ASUS, Asus M.2 um, PCIe uh, Hyper M.2 add-in card. So you can see you've got one, two, three, four M.2 SSDs that you could put on one card, slide that into a compatible motherboard and slot, and bam, you've got four M.2 SSDs that you could run into a RAID configuration or you could run them in single drive volume configurations. It's up to you. But um, it is an easy way that if you want to add more M.2, you can do it that way. All right. So hopefully that covers us there. So that it wraps up our questions from our friends over at Instagram. And again, if you want to answer your question in the, excuse me, if you want to ask your question in the future, uh, feel free to go ahead and email me at pcdiy at asus.com and just make sure to go ahead and utilize the hashtag ask asus. If you're checking us out on one of our social streams right now, then you can also feel free to go ahead and drop a comment. We'll try to follow up with you guys when we can. And again, if you're checking us out on Instagram on Tuesdays, we're going to do a QA uh, moving forward every Tuesday on Instagram. All right. So let's go ahead and get ready to check out some cool PC builds. Let me get a sip of my tea here and we will get moving along here. So give me one second. Hey, Stardust, any updates on the PG32 UQXC? Um, no updates outside of what I've already listed in the P, uh, the product release calendar in the PCDIY group. So if you're not part of the PCDIY group, make sure to join our group and you can check out the product release calendar. I update it probably every about seven to 14 days. Right now, I think our current projection is probably sometime in Q3. Um, as to when in Q3, I don't have more information for you yet, but make sure to keep it tuned um, as far as for that upcoming monitor, okay? Uh, Earl Grey hot. I like your style. Um, it's actually not Earl Grey. Uh, this is actually um, some, uh, it's a mix. It's actually uh, baby white and green. Um, uh, so combined together, but I'm definitely a fan of Earl Grey and who isn't, right? Uh, so <laughs> let's go ahead and uh, see if we got any other questions here before we jump into it. 
Uh, hey, James. Yes, uh, we do also have the Loki uh, updated in the product release calendar right now. We don't have a full confirmation yet in terms of the timeline. Probably get a little bit more information as we get into the very beginning of Q2. So probably early next month, we'll have an update. But I have already gone ahead and added the Loki in terms of the product release calendar. So if you take a look at the product release calendar, you'll see that it's listed there. And we'll actually have the estimated release information. But definitely rest assured when we're getting ready to release it, just like the monitors and the other products that we talked about at the very beginning of the stream, I will make sure to inform users not only via the group, but also here on the stream, okay? All right, so let's get ready to check out some cool builds. Let's see who we got up first. I think first is gonna be a Tech Cave, um, and that's gonna be with the Black Owl. I think that's what that's a, that's our first build. Yep, all right, so let's, let's take a look and see what we got going on here. Ooh, pretty interesting. All right. Got some interesting photos here. All right. So let's take a look right here. Oh, actually, before I start that off, uh, uh, for those of you that are new and, uh, of course, haven't joined in before, uh, this is the Asus PC DIY Builder Spotlight. So this is where we feature your builds. It doesn't matter whether it's ATX, whether it's uh, mini ITX, micro ITX, your first build or a water cooled build, whether you're a modder or whether it's the first time you put together a system, as long as it's featuring some core ASUS components, we'd love to feature it here on the stream. So all you got to do is use uh, the Google submission form and you can have your system featured here on the ASUS PC DIY hardware live stream. And we'd love to feature it. So um, make sure to go ahead and submit your build if you want to see it featured. All right. So let's go ahead and get into it and check out Black Owl. All right. Ooh, I'm already loving the color scheme. One of my favorite colors is gonna definitely be orange and yellow, two of my favorite colors. So I'm already liking what I see right here with, we've got, of course, a tough gaming board. We can see some beautiful black, and then we can see that nice kind of uh, golden kind of yellow kind of orange vibe that we've got going on here. Ooh, I'm liking this. This is pretty cool. This is pretty slick. Okay, and let's keep taking a look right here. So we can see that we've got some Kingston Fury. Um, I can already tell that's an ROG Strix card. Um, that probably looks like a 20 series card right there. Some really cool bends that we've got right here for the hard line, which is very interesting. Um, some beautiful cables here, kind of in a very much monochrome color scheme where you've got uh, this kind of gray going alongside this black. Some nice clean combs right there. And... Uh, we can see we got M.2, nice EK block in there. Yep, there is going to be the Strix card. And this is oriented, very interesting. I can tell this is probably going to be in a chassis where you've got, um, it's flat. And I think this is in one of those chassis where it looks like kind of like a pyramid type design. There you go. Oh, very, very cool. So that was the inside of the system. That's a pretty slick system. So um, very cool. You can see definitely on the inside, right, that you don't see a lot of the system. And that's kind of cool. This is just kind of more of an aesthetic kind of style chassis where the chassis is really at the forefront of the system, as opposed to kind of showing you the rest. But there's a beautiful kind of design in the front. Um, I don't know if the, the panel is removable, but it's, it'd be interesting to kind of see what it looks like if you didn't have the panel present. So you could kind of see the inside of the system. But I love this etching right here. It's a really nice level of detailing. You've got all your front I.O. Um, overall, very, very cool kind of design right here. Um, let me see, Bianca, uh, you've got a question right there. Let me see right here if I can answer this quickly before we go keep going with the PC Daddy Google Builder Spotlight here. Um, can you help me answer the source on the Thor? to 1600 watts yes so um we have talked about this in the past it's also in the product release calendar in the pc diy group but in terms of product release cycle the thousand watt will be first we're going to be releasing that hopefully by the end of this month it should be out it's right now i'm actually moving out to distribution so it might even be a little bit earlier than the end of this month probably in the next two weeks approximately then the 1200 watt then the 1600 watt and last will be the 850 watt. Um, right now I would probably project the 1600 watt will not be sometime until maybe middle of Q2 timeframe. We'll probably have a bit more information as we get into kind of the middle to end of next month in terms of the 1600 watt. But the first two models that will be coming out in the Thor 2 will be the 1000 watt and then the 1200 watt. Okay. All right. So um, overall, very, very cool design. Um, Tech Caveman, kudos. This it's really clean. It's really polished. It's got a beautiful design aesthetic. I really love the overall look and feel of this, and the color scheme is gorgeous. Um, I don't know which shot to almost kind of use here. I'm going to kind of leave it maybe on this one for a second as I bring up his um, submission form. So give me one second to bring up his submission form and just make sure to have everything up here. So give me one second. 
And I think also Tech Cave, yeah, uh, I'll go ahead and I'll link uh, their YouTube channel because they do actually have a YouTube channel. So if you guys actually want to check them out, you can uh, check them out here. That's cool. Oh, okay, cool. He's also got a Builds GG profile up. So uh, let's go ahead and quickly take a look here, see if there's any other images that you had there for the Builds GG profile. Yeah, we can definitely see also those deep, deep, cool fans. Those deep, cool fans that have a really cool design kind of X pattern to them, which is kind of cool. It definitely has a really cool, clean vibe to it. And I love that color scheme. So yeah, that's that's Black Owl. I, I like Black Owl, guys. I, hopefully you guys are a fan. Oh, look, he's got a multi-monitor surround setup. Uh, that's kind of cool. It's very clean. Oh, there. Oh, so you can actually see where it's a little bit more, almost looks tinted in the other images. I love that you actually can kind of see in the hardware as you get a little bit closer. So that's actually pretty cool. So I do like that element right there. So uh, let me go ahead and bring up the rest of his submission form here. Um, so give me one second. Okay. And uh, let's go with... Sorry, what image we're going to go with here. Mm, yeah, we'll leave it, I guess, just on that primary, which I think works well. Okay. All right. And uh, let's see. So this system um, is going to be yeah, from Tech Cave right here. And it was a sponsored base build. Um, does the build have a theme? It was built to have a stealthy look. Uh, from this name, of course, the Black Owl. Three words to describe the build is modern, stealth, and elegant. Um, the name is Black Owl. Um, in terms of the core components, we'll take a look at those there in a second. So give me one second here to bring those up. Looks like we've got a Tough Gaming Z370 series motherboard. It was a Core i9-9900K that's in there. Um, had 16 gigabytes of memory that was in there. Um, and then an RG Strix 2070, um, a one terabyte a Kingston A2000 base SSD, um, deep cool, uh, 650 watt power supply. And then of course the Pyramid 804 is the chassis and then quite a number of the MF120S deep cool fans. So that's what helps to leverage kind of that cool design aesthetic that we have throughout the system. Um, very, very nice. Um, what aspect was he most proud of? The glass engraving and the tubing, especially the ones that go all around the pyramid. And I would definitely agree. What he's talking about there is, again, the tubing that we can see right here that actually runs all around. Um, this is actually a little bit of a challenge. I mean, the bends aren't super, super hard, but the length of this type of bend to go around that, that's actually challenging. Um, so I'll give a lot of credit right there to actually be able to maintain a consistency and a uniformity to that is actually pretty challenging, even if you've got the correct tools um, to be able to do that, because it's a timing factor to make sure to be able to heat everything and enough consistency to be able to get those all in line and have them work out well. So um, that's pretty slick, pretty nicely done. Um, anything they would change about the build? No, not really. Um, took about a couple of months, including the wait to be able to get all the components from the partners that were supporting it. Um, it was overall used for a system was for showcase. Um, and his favorite overall Asus element was that he really was a big fan of the Asus Tough Series motherboard, as well as he also was a fan of just overall the kind of the build quality and the design of the ROG Strix graphics card. Um, hey, man, overall, I think this is a very cool build. I love the color scheme. I love the non-traditional chassis that we've got on display here. And definitely your bends, they were nicely executed, man. So it gets a nice thumbs up from me. Nice build. All right. So let's go ahead and get ready to take a look at our next build here. Um, let's go ahead and bring up, I think this is going to be a Guinness from Casey. So give me one second here to bring up his images as well as his submission form. Um, one question. Give me one second here. Let me bring it up here, Guinness. Okay, very cool. All right, and let's bring up his submission form. All right, got everything up here. All right. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look here. 
All right, so interesting. We've got a little bit of an access kind of viewed setup right here. This is kind of interesting. Um, we can see that we've got kind of this cool stealth kind of vibe, right? This is a lot of black. And then we've got, looks like, I don't think this is going to be a pure white that he settled on. Maybe a little bit kind of like a subtle orange kind of tinge to it as I'm kind of getting. So a little bit of that orange. I like that. Not purely kind of the white, just a little bit of the soft color in there. I think that looks pretty slick. Um, so uh, we can see some nice little cool accent shots right there. That is a very cool shot. He's of got the uni fans, which a lot of people love because, of course, they're daisy chain based design. You can see right here he's got a hero board that looks fantastic. That Strix card always looks so nice in that horizontal orientation because of that really nice big RGB light bar that you have right there. Um, and very clean. I also love the fact that he didn't necessarily go RGB on everything. Just a little bit of nice fill lighting here. And then you've got this focus on clean airflow. What looks like these are Be Quiet fans, uh, Silent Wings right there. So you've got some high, high quality fans right there. And overall, this is a very nice, clean, and well-executed system. It's definitely a little bit on that darker side, but I like that because it's purposely kind of giving you contrast, kind of blacking everything out with that stealth vibe, right? And then just giving you some nice pops of color for soft illumination. So you got the illumination there at the top, the illumination from the memory right there on the side of the motherboard and there on the graphics card. And even the pump, this is all kind of blacked out here with this EKIO that he's got set up in there. So overall, very nice, Casey. You have consistently always done a great job, though, with your builds. Very clean. They're well executed, well spaced out and overall designed. Of course, the big one is always whether or not people prefer the over or under when it comes to the PCI cables on the graphics cards. I think it looks really nice. I got no complaints with this type of setup right here. So um, let's go ahead and take a look here and see what you got for your, your submission form. So this is going to be from KC. You can also go ahead and check him out at uh, KC's PCs on Instagram if you guys want to be able to go ahead and see his build. Um, does the build have a theme? It is called the Gentleman's Build. That is the overall theme, right? Uh, three words uh, to describe his build. A simplistic, powerful, and quiet. And the name is Guinness. All right. Um, so let's go ahead and see right here core components that we have for the system. This is running a Ryzen 7 5800X an EKAO Basic 360, a Crosshair 8 Hero, um, 3600 uh, megahertz, 32 gigabytes of G-scale memory, a one terabyte NVMe a drive, and then an Asus Strix 3080 car, and that's all inside, of course, of an O11, a very popular chassis, 1,000 watt power supply. Yep, he's actually not the Silent Wings, but the Shadow Wings, uh, too, uh, for the Be Quiet fans. And then also those uni fans from uh, Lian Li. And then he's got some extensions from Asia Horse. Overall, it's a really nice balance of hardware. Not going crazy kind of anything, but a really nice combination of just some nice looking hardware to be able to set off a nice aesthetic, be able to give you nice performance. I'm a fan of this kind of setup and this kind of build. Budget was about $3,000. Um, he was actually most happy and most uh, kind of proud of the, the actual budget and hitting all the hardware that he hit for that budget. Um, anything that he would maybe change about it, he would maybe add a screen on the inside. That could be kind of interesting. Um, I know a lot of people add that kind of screen right here on the back side uh, for the O11. Um, let's see what else. How long did it take him to put it all together? About three months. He upgraded it one by one. Of course, not all of us can get all the hardware at one time, especially in this era. It had been a little bit challenging, so that makes sense. Um, he uses it for uh, studying, school, and gaming. And then for gaming, he likes to play some Valorant, Warzone, um, and Vanguard. Very cool. Um, his favorite overall ASUS-centric feature is the ASUS UEFI. He absolutely finds it's the easiest to use and really is a big fan of its overall flexibility and the functionality. So, Casey, definite thumbs up for me, man. I like this build. It's clean. It's polished. It's well executed. Um, and the aesthetic, it's very it's very classy. It is definitely uh, hitting that mark for a gentleman build. So, um, gets my thumbs up. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, bring up our next build. Give me one second here. So uh, Bianca says, Guinness is very nice PC. I would agree. Daxter is asking, what's the airflow pattern of a 30 or 20 series Strix cards? Well, uh, they are axial-based fans and they're downward firing, right? So the actual um, static pressure is designed to actually go down through the heatsink assembly and then kind of push outwards, right? So um, not sure when or what else you're kind of thinking about. Most graphics cards are designed in that fashion, right? So they're actually going to pull air 
and then blow them directly into the actual heat sink assembly, right? That is generally the way that it is going to work. Um, as far as kind of supplemental forms of dissipation, there could also be, of course, there's the heat sink assembly itself. And then there also might be maybe supplemental portions of the heat sink assembly, which make power uh, contact with other power componentry or memory or certain parts of the card if they require or merit additional um, essentially thermal dissipation. Um, one question is asking about the XG249. Um, yes, so that monitor is going to be coming out. Um, I will double check and see if I can check with our team. If you want to tag me in the PCDIY group, um, you can do that. But that actually should be probably hitting um, by, I think, about the end of this month. Uh, the last time I checked in terms of the actual update. So we should probably be seeing it getting ready to roll out to kind of distribution as it is right now. So you should see that hopefully within about the next two weeks or so. Um, again, keep in mind that if you're outside the US, I can't tell you because everything related to logistics and availability is for the US and for Canada. If you're in a different region, you would have to check with ASUS in your region because different, um, uh, excuse me, products and their assortment are different in different regions. So let's say ASUS Italy versus ASUS Japan versus ASUS um, you know, Germany, they could all differ in terms of actually their product assortment and the timeline that they carry for those products, okay? All right, so let's go over into our next build. Okay, ooh, Meshalicious Power Pack. I think this, this is actually a, a very cool build. When I um, found this build, I thought this was actually a really, really cool small form factor build. I was very excited about actually featuring this guy. So uh, let's get ready to go ahead and take a look here at Meshalicious Power Pack. All right, so here we can see we've got a very interesting build. You can already tell this is going to be a compact guy. Uh, this is a small form factor based build. Oh, so right here we can already tell that we've got some different things going on, right? This is not your run of the mill type of build, right? Um, so we can see right here, this is pretty interesting. So here we can see we've got the graphics card. Really cool design right here with actually some very thin cables, right, uh, to allow for more flexibility and maybe airflow. Um, although we've got water cooling set up in play here to take care of everything, right? But you've got your water block on your card. You've got some nice soft tubing. I'm always a fan of soft tubing setups. And some very interesting customization work here in terms of what actually looks like some quick, uh, quick disconnect fittings. Um, to be able to go ahead and set up to an external rad, which is really cool because that makes sense, right? Take advantage of the inside, but then move the actual radiator to the outside and then be able to still give yourself room and space to be able to fit in high performance components. So this is a very cool and very interesting type of design, very innovative, so kudos. Um, so yeah, we can see right here. Oh, I haven't seen coolants in a while. I'm a big fan. I actually still have one of my systems is running on some coolants, water cooling hardware, and I've always been a fan of their quick disconnect fittings. I thought they were fantastic. Actually, I used them a lot for um, my test bed setups because I could put that on the block, disconnect the cables, bam, it'd be so easy. And I could just kind of swap in and out, not have to worry about any leaks or anything. Um, one of the big reasons why I'm still a fan of soft tubing more so than hard tubing. Um, so this setup is very cool and then we've got a massive you can see uh, of course 420 radiator with four fans right there all running into this so you got tons of thermal dissipation performance right here um, with this type of rad for this type of system i'm assuming that you can also keep these probably running at a very moderate rpm probably somewhere between maybe like 600 to probably like 850 rpm maybe like a thousand so this is probably very quiet um very easily cools the overall thermal dissipation there we can see we've got the pump in the reservoir right there. Very slick. This is really cool. I love this setup. Really nice, cool and clean setup right there where you can see that system. And then we've got that external radiator. Oh, and then bam, there we go. There's our system, right? So you can see he's got a small compact power supply, those beautiful clean custom cables to give yourself a nice lot of space in there. And then he's got a crosshair impact. Uh, looks like probably is in that system right there. Um, and then with that water cold CPU, this is a really, really cool setup. Uh, I really dig this overall use of space, high performance based system, but in a compact based design and really sensible in terms of just bringing all of that outside. 
Hey, Tom, do we sell any water cool 3090? Yes. Yeah, so we actually have the RG Strix LC series. And then, of course, we have the broadest water block support um, um, in the industry. So whether you want a block from, you know, EK, from Thermal Take, from Bits Power, from Optimus, we have uh, Alpha Cool. We've got wide range of partners that all produce water blocks. So whether you want to go with a RG Strix card and then water block it, or if you want to get something like the Tough Gaming LC, excuse me, the RG Strix LC series, we've got you covered. OK, um, so very, very cool. I'm a big fan of this overall build and setup. That's very cool, very clean, well executed. Um, I think we've got maybe a little bit of a video right here that he's got for us. So let's see if we can uh, do it. I don't want to worry about any type of uh, copy copyright there. So let's go ahead and lower the audio. That's pretty slick. All right, there, yeah, there you can see the pump and the res. Uh, you got your flow monitoring right there. Really nice, clean cable management, man. This is, you know what? I'm going to give this, this is, uh, for me, I'm, I feel like this is a master class level build. It's really cleanly done. Um, it's got a nice, refined design aesthetic, purposeful, um, you know, selection of components with a nice layout that also is really great in terms of the performance. So um, uh, uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, Julio? Julio, man, you get a big thumbs up, man, for me. Masterclass build. This, for me, is one of my favorite small form factor builds. It really kind of bridges that outstanding balance in terms of giving you um, a really high performance system, but in a compact based design with a little bit of a non traditional approach. So, very, very cool. Oh, and then he threw in the temperatures. We can see right there, even with his system, um, you know, rendering, you can see that his average was only 44C, right? And then 32C for the GPU, right? Um, and then, of course, that water temperature, right, 29. So very, very impressive, man. Very, very cool. Overall, this gets a definite thumbs up for me. Um, very cool build. Let us let me go ahead and I don't even know where to, where, where to leave a, a picture right here. Um, I guess I'm going to leave it maybe on this one right here. I guess we'll go with with that bill that that shot right there because that's a pretty good example of the system although you didn't get to see the cool little inside uh, but let me go ahead and bring up his submission form so uh let's go ahead and see here he's got an instagram let me go ahead and drop his instagram in there in the chat anybody wants to go ahead and check him out all right so uh let's see here does the build have a theme? It was inspired by modern industrial CNC robot cells. Okay, I can see that. Three words to describe the build is small, no compromise in the integrated control. I think those all fit uh, with the overall theme. Does it have a name? Yes, Meshalicious Power Pack. <laughs> uh, I think that works, definitely. Um, so yeah, he has a crosshair impact in there. He's running a 3950X and then also running a 1080 Ti, um, 64 gigabytes of memory. Uh, that's probably why he picked the impact board because the impact board was one of the first boards to be able to support that ultra high density um, DDR4 two DIMM based designs for a mini ITX system. He's got eight terabytes of SSD, right? Uh, so um, that's impressive, makes sense though. This is a system that he's using for editing. And then an external 480 millimeter radiator with a smart D5 pump, right? Um, and then he's got the, of course, uh, high-end custom water-cooled hardware there with the heat uh, heat killer, EK coolants, and aqua computer, aqua computer parts all in there. Um, very, very sweet. And then, of course, that customized power connector that he's also got uh, present in there. Um, no budget. He just used all essentially the hardware that he already had on hand. So it was just all about kind of bringing it all together. Um, he was most proud of being able to achieve the external cooling uh, external cooling unit design and setup. So it's self-controlled self and programmable fan and pump curves, which of course makes sense. Like I said, that allows for really quiet and effective operation um, to be able to not only keep all the temperatures in check, but like I said, make sure that especially in a workflow system, this is not going to be loud. Um, let me see. Uh, the unit can be plugged into another case and doesn't require any oh that's very interesting so he can actually because of the actual modular cable design he can actually um connect and disconnect it easily and bring it over to another system to be able to work with it that's a really cool level of flexibility right with those quick disconnects that makes sense right um the loop inside in case is parallel 
which I would also agree that's very rare that you would see that within a small form factor case. So overall, I think the implementation, that's why I said it, I really do feel it's a masterclass build, right? The level of kind of customization and flexibility that he went ahead and implemented was quite impressive. Um, let me see if we can go back out here and go back to, there's that customized connectors, right? And that external rad. And there's a shot there of the system. Anything they would change about the build? Um, uh, maybe a customized kind of radiator stand would maybe be something you would want to add. Took about four uh, weekends. That's like definitely not bad. And uses it predominantly for professional video editing and color grading. His favorite aspect in terms of Asus hardware feature is the crosshair impact. Um, and it's the reason why he went with an SSF based workstation. Tons of USB for his external drives and extra stable even with the uh, PBO tuned operation that he has. Overall, man, very, very nice. Big thumbs up. Um, I absolutely love your build, man. Hats off on the creativity. Okay. Uh, so, so interesting. Dexter says the room must be hot with the rat outside. I don't think that it's a question that it was hot outside. I think that it made sense, right? Because the reality is trying to, I think, cramp everything in is really quite challenging. Mostly smaller system chassis are not really designed for it. And then the flexibility of him doing the external rad with the quick disconnects. Remember, he can bring the system over from one place to another and then be able to connect it and disconnect it, right? That's a level of flexibility you just wouldn't have if you kind of integrated everything all together, right? It's also going to be a difference in weight and also just makes the inside much more accessible at working with it. So I think it's a really great balance of being able to benefit from the performance of externally going that route, having a quieter system with even better thermal dissipation performance, but then having more flexibility on how you set up and define the internal setup. So I think it was a very creative approach. Very, very cool. All right. Um, let's go ahead and go to our next build here. We've got Money Pit <laughs> from Nathan. Okay. Um, I know there's definitely some builders that probably feel that way about their system sometimes is that it can sometimes be a bit of a money pit. Well, um, let's see what we've got right here. Okay, let's go ahead and bring this up right here. Oh, this is very cool. All right. Um, so we've got a very interesting kind of setup and layout in here in this board. So we've got a vertical GPU. So I'm not always the biggest fan of vertical GPU mounts. I think they sometimes take away from the aesthetic that you have within a board. But if you're kind of focusing on having a specific kind of, I'd say, encompassing theme, a vertical GPU can definitely do that for you. And I think that's what Nathan was trying to achieve here, where we can see that we have this kind of synchronicity in terms of the top and the bottom, where you can see that you have the tubing running from the top down here to the actual block. And this is kind of contiguous. Plus, you've got some interesting depth and lines here with one of these being in the back, then another being in the forefront, and then this all coming down along with this really cool, nice spiral. The spiral looks really nicely done. This is actually a definite challenge when you talk about bends, so kudos to you there. And even these uh, bends look quite good. Um, some of these tight bends like these, these little 90s, they're definitely not always the easiest. They can look deceptive in terms of actually their ease. And I also give a credit here because we're not using anything like a distro. I mean, this is not, not the type of chassis that traditionally you would see a distro utilized in. Um, but I love, that's part of the reason why I like soft tubing a lot is because it looks a little bit kind of more fluid and kind of variable. So I really like the approach here that Nathan took at having a little bit more varied lines um, that you don't see where you have so many kind of just hard perpendicular lines when you go with distros. Um, so this is a really cool overall kind of design and setup. Um, I'm digging it and I like the color scheme too. Um, this is pretty cool in terms of this overall look and feel. So let's uh, continue to look here. We can see, of course, we've got the large radiator up here at the top, three fans, a uh, block for the CPU, a block, of course, for the GPU. And then you've got your pump res, and you got another pump res, and another radiator, and then, of course, more cooling right there. So we've got a dual setup right there. And then the RGB, very, very cool. Uh, definitely the RGB gives it a different vibe. I'm a little bit sad to lose a little bit of visibility with that hero logo, but this aesthetic does look really nice and it would have been a little bit challenging because you would have had to modify this bend to look weird, either kind of go like something like a tight bend and then down here to kind of go that route, or you would have to go a little bit tighter, maybe adjust this fitting and kind of go up and then go in there to give this space a little bit. I mean, there's different ways to approach it, but I think this still works. It looks great. This design is very, very cool with the spiral. It gives it a very interesting design aesthetic, and the color is very interesting. Oh, you included on cable management shot. Very, very nice. This is also all 
clean and well done. Nothing to complain about here. It's well isolated. Of course, in an RGB system, it's always a challenge. So you can see he's got a Corsair commander in there that's running his RGB. Um, nice, clean, well laid out. No issues right there. Only thing sometimes I'll do is I'll separate sometimes my uh, cables specific to where they might be routed. So I have them a little bit more separated out. Sometimes I'll actually use Velcro that's uh, color coded. Um, well, excuse me, hook and loop fasteners that are color coded. So I know which lines are going where, but otherwise uh, definitely thumbs up there in terms of the cable management. And overall, just some additional shots there. Uh, this is a really cool build, man. I really like this name. Um, I think it's a very, very cool setup. So let's go ahead and take a look and see here what you've got in terms of your submission form. A Geekbench guy says RGB, RGB, right? Um, and I don't necessarily know that it screams RGB. I think it screams kind of more kind of purposeful design um, when you talk about kind of the overall aesthetic, which I think has been really well thought, kind of thought out and it looks good. So let me see what we've got here from the submission form. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> so this is going to be <clears throat> not his first build. Um, does the build have a theme? Chilled first water cooled build. I didn't want to overkill the RGB, and it was only his actually second build ever. So I give you a huge amount of credit, man. Big thumbs up for this actually being on your second build and going for some actually pretty challenging bends here in terms of that. So a huge credit to you, man, because definitely there's some quite complicated build uh, bends in here that um, I wouldn't see, um, especially I think in only somebody's second build ever. So very, very uh, cool um, in terms of not only the creativity, but also uh, kudos on your execution. Three words to describe the build, cool, clean, and strong. Uh, the name of the build, Money Pit. In terms of our hardware here, we've got a Crosshair 8 Hero, a Ryzen 9 5900X, 32 gigabytes of memory in there. He's got a 3070 graphics card with the Bisky block on there. A Neptua fans uh, that he has in there, um, Chromax. And then that's all inside of a Meshify 2XL. He's got a one terabyte NVMe, PCI NVMe drive in there. And then another 860 uh, 2.5 inch one terabyte drive. He's got the two Corsair XD3 pump and res combos. And then he's got three radiators, one radiator on the top, one radiator in the front, and one radiator on the bottom. So a 360, a 360, and a 240. Um, pretty much using Corsair fittings throughout, along with PET tubing um, that he has there. His overall budget was like somewhere around 4,000, kind of lost track after kind of getting everything all together. He's most proud of the spiral, which I would definitely agree. It's a very nice uh, spiral, but I agree all his bends and his runs are actually well laid out and it looks really nice. And also I give credit that I think the lighting is not overdone and it gives it a nice touch. The only thing that I might tweak just a little bit is this LED strip. Um, I would maybe put a diffuse strip on here to have this be a little bit more of a glow as opposed to this hard spotlight or maybe flip it so that I get a little bit more of that bounced light coming down as opposed to having it be the hard light that's visible. That's about the only one that I feel detracts just a smidge uh, from kind of the aesthetic of this. Otherwise, um, I love the way that the rest turned out. Um, absolutely, is there anything that you would change about the build? Absolutely, next cleaning, I'll be moving the tube covering the hero logo on the motherboard. So he actually is gonna do uh, what I noted there and also be adding another feature run in the tubing as well. That's pretty cool. It'd be interesting to see how that turns out. Um, took him about a week of evenings, um, and he was always waiting on the parts. Um, uses it pretty much for gaming. Loves to play some Halo Infinite, Apex Legends, and Warzone. And he loves Asus Armory Crate to be able to control the lighting and overall monitoring his system, man. Um, Nathan, kudos, man. Hats off to you. A great build, especially for only it being your second build. Okay, very, very cool. All right, so let's go and uh, take a look. We still have, I think, a couple of builds left here. So give me one sec to bring these guys up here. Uh, we've got our Gundam build from Ben. All right, very, very cool. So give me a second here to open up the submission form. All right, very cool. Oh, first shot is actually a little bit out of order, but hey, uh, let's go ahead and take a look here. First one is gonna be cable management, very nicely done. He's got an actual Gundam Helios chassis. So that's our 
uh, large chassis, nice, clean, well done in terms of the cable management, nothing to critique there. Kudos to him even actually including cable management shot because not everybody does. Um, and then here, really nicely done in terms of overall layout. So um, really nicely done here in terms of the overall cabling and everything. This is super clean, no comments. Um, even I know the cabling here for the power supply um, I believe he actually did some hand cutting and crimping here to be able to actually kind of make this work even slicker than the default cable setup because it wouldn't look actually this clean in terms of the cables um, because of the way that they're actually designed. So I give him a huge amount of credit. This looks really nice. I love the touch on adding the custom Gundam model in there to be able to actually hold the graphics card. That's very slick. Very cool, nice little setup right there. Uh, looks like he added in even the cable management to actually add a cable and a card here to be able to give all the front IO, uh, which is I think what this actually little card is. Um, that's a nice little touch right there. He's got the, I love this cooler. This is the Gundam edition, Strix LC series cooler, but the Gundam edition version of it. Um, this came out really, really nice. So very, very cool. Yeah, I uh, definitely would agree. Let me see right here. Bianca says, uh, uh, very nice Gundam. Yeah, I would definitely agree. It looks really, really clean. Um, I'm excited to see what we get, of course, with the RGB and then with the RGB, of course it looks even better, right? Um, so it's got that cool, nice, vibrant color scheme. Love in the, of course, you can see the accenting there for the card, the nice lighting that we've got there on the dims. He went with white dims to give a little bit more reflectiveness. And then that nice, of course, uh, color that we have there on the cooler and then a little bit of fill lighting that is present there on the power supply. This is something that I think he even added in there because of course this default power supply does not have lighting in there. So that's a nice little touch too. So some nice little customizations here. The Helios doesn't also have an RGB fan in the back. So he added that. So that's also a nice little touch. Oh, very, very cool. I love that he didn't add the RGB fans here in the front so that you can fully see the RX actually imprint on the front of the chassis. So that's really nicely done. And you can see he filled it out with all the actual Gundam accessories. So this was pretty lucky of him to be able to get these because these items were not normally available. They were limited production. So he was actually able to pick up the um, throne, the Delta headset, the keyboard, the mouse, the mouse pad, the chassis, the cooler, the motherboard, and the graphics card and power supply and monitor. Man, that's awesome. Fantastic setup. I, I love it. I love it. This is this is a very, very cool setup. Um, I'm going to leave it on the shot right here, though, of the system right here. And we're going to go ahead and take a look here at the submission form. So let me bring this up. So let's take a look here. This is from Ben. Uh, does the build have a theme? Yes, Asus and Gundam. That was a full Gundam-based build. Um, no name for the system. Um, this is going to be used uh, as far as the hardware configuration. It's a Core i7-11700K. It's fantastic CPU uh, for this type of build, especially if we're focusing on gaming. But really, 11700K, it's going to give you great performance all for kind of any type of scenario. Uh, the, of course, the 360 AIO, Z590Y from Gun Gundam Edition board, 32 gigabytes of memory. It's got a one terabyte boot drive in there and then a two terabyte game drive in there. Um, then the 3080, of course, Gundam series graphics card. Um, 850 watt Gundam power supply, the Gundam edition Helios. And then he's got a three Noctua NF140 fans that are in there, along with a Cooler Master a Master fan that also is running on the board. Um, RG Strix Scope TKL, a Strix Impact, and Sheath, and Delta, and Throne, and XG Series Monitor, all of which are the Gundam editions. About $5,300 for everything in terms of the build. It's actually quite a bit of hardware, but very good pricing. Uh, if you consider all the hardware that we have right there. Uh, the fact that he was not only able to get all the core PC Gundam components, but by altering the GPU cables made for a much cleaner look. I would definitely agree that that's what you should be more proud of. It's a testament to be able to have gotten all this hardware, especially after it was no longer in production. Um, and then uh, being able to do that customization there for the actual cabling came out really, really nice. Anything you would change about the build? No, and I would agree. There's nothing to change about it. It's clean, it's well executed, and it's going to be a fantastic build. Um, 
It took him about seven hours to put it all together. Um, his wife uh, will be using it for gaming. Uh, she's generally interested in playing Sims 4 and the upcoming Hogwarts Legacy game. So very, very cool. Um, definitely, uh, you might be surprised, but Sims 4, if you do a lot of panning, you have a lot of characters, a higher resolution actually can be actually fairly demanding. So it's actually going to allow for a great experience for that. And I'm sure it's also just going to be a great kind of general usage system. So cool in that respect. And he's just a big fan of how all that Asus Gundam hardware came together in terms of the aesthetic. And then, of course, being able to kind of tie everything together with that RGB lighting, man. Ben, thumbs up. A great looking build. Happy to be able to feature it here on the stream. Kudos. All right. So let's get ready here. I think we've got two last builds here, and then we're going to be wrapping it up. So let's go uh, to our next build right here. Uh, another no name build, and this is going to be from, let me see right here. Uh, this is going to be from Harji. And Harji has a YouTube channel that you guys can go ahead and check out if you're interested. So let me go ahead and drop that in the chat if you guys want to be able to go ahead and check it out. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look here. All right. This is a pretty cool build. Um, yeah, this is definitely pretty slick. So uh, we've got a hardline base build here with a vertical mount. And the really cool thing here is, of course, we can see the way that the actual vertical mount has been implemented. So when I talked about before, I'm not always the biggest fan. Sometimes I feel it's because it takes away the identity of the kind of the board design. But what we can see right here is that Harji went with a really cool type of design that gives you a kind of contiguous look and feel that is all about the builds, right? And I think this works really well. And you can see that this is done with having a very tight proximity up against the board to be able to run in these beautiful bends from the block that then run into the next block. So from the CPU to the GPU that then goes into the pump and the res and very minimal. I mean, there's not a huge number of bends in here, but the bends themselves are part of the aesthetic. They're beautifully done. Great color combination of the black, silver, and then the purple all tied together. It's a really nice, clean aesthetic. And I really like the way this came out. Um, so I'm definitely a big fan of this overall kind of layout and the look and feel. Um, it's really nicely done. And the white accents also here, I think, really nicely pop. So very, very clean. Um, very well done. So we can see this is done inside of the new Fractal Design Torrent chassis. Um, of course, it's designed definitely for airflow. It's not that critical here because we've got a water-cooled setup. But of course, you're going to be able to get great performance that you got with that radiator in terms of where it's positioned. Um, overall, very nice, very clean. Um, and again, those runs are really nicely done. Got that classic plant shot in there to give you contrast. Um, that's a, it's a beautiful looking build. And I think definitely an overall um, really nice level of execution and polish. And definitely one of my favorite uh, implementations for a vertical mount. So you get a lot of credit there, Haji. Let's go ahead and take a look right here and see um, what we've got in terms of your submission form. So give me one second to bring it up here. Um, so... Uh, does the build have a theme? No theme, just colors. Uh, three words to describe the build, black, silver, and pink. So sorry, not purple, but pink. Yeah, I can see where that is, right? Um, does the build have a name? Nope. Um, in terms of, let's see, core hardware, we've got a crosshair, eight dark hero board in there with a tough uh, 3080 Ti graphics card in there. So very, very nice um, hardware configuration, about $4,500 with the budget. He's most proud of the U-Bends on the tubing, which I would definitely agree. Those bends are very nice. These are tight and very clean. This bend, smooth, clean, and this is a really nice bend coming off here. This is a very tight bend right here. Subtle, clean, comes down. Another one, another one. Very, very nicely done. This U right here is a beautiful U. This comes out right here and then goes like this. Very, very nice. Very, very clean. So... Really well done. Anything you would change about the build? Nope. How long did it take him to do? About one week. Uh, it's pretty much a gaming system. Uh, loves pl or playing Resident Evil, uh, Flight Simulator, and TF Team. Um, his overall favorite aspect is definitely the aesthetic of our motherboards as well as our graphics cards and being able to kind of tie it together. I'm wondering with the Dark Hero board if he happened to use the um, water cooling zone headers that we have on here, like the pump header or maybe the input and 
um, output temperature flow and monitoring functionality because I think that would work well for this build, but fantastic setup. And of course, with the Dark Hero, he's got that dynamic OC switcher technology to be able to really even maximize the performance further, which is complementary to all that cooling performance that he has right there. Overall, Hygiene, this is a fantastic build. It's clean, well done. It's got a really nice aesthetic. I would definitely agree right there. Bam. Um, very nice job on the bends. You got a vote up there from Michael. I'm definitely going to say nicely done. All right. So we've got one last, uh, I think, build here, guys. So give me one second here. Uh, again, and kudos there uh, for this build. All right. So um, let's see. Our last build is going to be, I believe, right here. Prime Minister from Shane. All right. So let's go ahead and see what we've got from Shane. Okay. Let's take a look here. Oh, ah, another vertical mount. Interesting. With a Prime Series board. That's a little bit on the rare side. We don't get as many people to do water cool builds with a Prime Series board, but this is a cool setup. Some very interesting kind of choices right here where we can see that we've got a distro implementation right here, which is kind of interesting, the vertical mount. And then we've got some interesting choices right here, adding a little bit of curvature, a little bit of kind of some variation, which I like, not necessarily keeping it so hard and perpendicular, which is kind of, kind of cool. So let's go ahead and see how this turned out here. Interesting. So we can see that we've got one radiator up here, 360. We've got a 240 down here. We've got our pump res combo back here. The motherboard, of course, with its block, that's going there into the distro. And then the GPU right here, which is then separately then going into the distro. And then you can see then what's going in there. Um, and then this, interesting, some nice cables right here. We've got some not white dims right there. We've got a little bit of blue. So I'm wondering what color is it we're going to have right here? Oh, blue. I like it. Uh, the white and the blue combination is always going to look fantastic, and I think this looks great. Interesting. Here we've got a little bit more. I'm getting green vibes, so I don't know if this was just a variant in terms of how we played it out. I like the, the blue a little bit more. I think if it was green here, I'd like to see a little bit stronger vibe with the green. I almost wonder if I would prefer to see um, an opaque fluid as opposed to going with, I don't know if it's distilled water or clear coolant, um, but I think for this, I think I would have preferred a bolder on the green, right? That's just, I think, where my preference is kind of leading me a little bit, um, but I really do like the blue vibe here. This, I think, looks fantastic, but the overall design and aesthetic is a cool and distinctive setup, so definitely cool, and it's very nicely done in terms of especially the layout and the bends as well. So uh, let me see here. Oh, it looks like those are the only shots that we've got here uh, from Prime Minister. I like the I like the overall look and the setup. It's definitely very interesting. It's cool. It's clean. It's well executed. It gets a definite thumbs up for me. I would have been interested to see what the GPU would have looked like, of course, though, horizontally to give a little bit more visibility to the silver, create some depth um, between the top and the bottom. And maybe you could have played around with lighting there on the bottom um, with that configuration if you would have gone with a horizontal setup. But... Um, I think this one is my favorite right here. So Michael says shiny. Um, it definitely has a little bit of that vibe. Let's go ahead and take a look here at what we've got for the submission form. Prime Minister is the theme. Um, three words to describe the build is cool and clean. Uh, the, the build name is also Prime Minister. Um, so let's see. We've got a Prime Z690-P in there with a 12900K. Um, he's got uh, DDR4-3600. Uh, three terabyte Samsung 980. Um, then he's got bits powers uh, for the pump and the rest combo. Um, uh, EK velocity in there as well. A 3070 Ti, which is of course with the quantum vector water block. Um, and then also with the active backplate in there. And then a quantum kinetic uh, that he's got in there for the pump and the res. Uh, number two, um, 360 radiator, and then the 240 radiator, and then a 1,000 watt power supply running all of that. Um, probably somewhere about four to $5,000 for the budget. He's most proud of the overall dual custom loop implementation. Uh, I think it's a definitely an interesting approach. Um, I think, you know, based on the hardware configuration, you didn't necessarily have to go that route, but I think it's cool in terms of laying that out. And definitely with the 11, it kind of works best when you probably have a dual implementation so that you don't have kind of wasted space. So I think, think in some ways you kind of have to go about that. Um, nothing that he would indicate that he would want to change about it. it took him about three days worth. Um, generally, he's going to be gaming. So God of War, Sifu, and Horizon Zero Dawn, 
all great games. Um, and he's a big fan of Army Crate and also the UEFI BIOS environment. Um, Shane, this gets a definite thumbs up for me. It's a cool, functional, clean build. And I also like the balance of like giving you a really high level of performance going with something like 12th Gen Series, but I mean on something like our Z690-P board, which is our entry, right, into our Prime Series, but still offers a very solid level of power delivery, can comfortably run that 12900K with no problems, and being able to actually water cool a platform, have a cool aesthetic to align with it, not necessarily go overspend on the board, but still get a great foundation, put that together with a great other set of hardware, and have a very cool water cooled build. So man, kudos, I definitely think you achieved everything you were looking for, with also a distinctive design that is not that common, in terms of 011 builds. So that's also another nice touch just to be able to see something a bit different compared to kind of uh, what a lot of people do when it comes to the 011. So, um, yeah. Overall, Prime Minister is a nice PC water cooling system, EK Dice. All right, guys. So that wraps up our stream. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us this week. As always, if you guys are interested in having your builds featured on the Asus PC DIY Builder Spotlight, make sure to go ahead and actually join us uh, in the Asus PC DIY group and uh, also go ahead and take advantage of the submission form. It's super easy in terms of being able to, um, you know, join and then be able to submit your system. So let me go ahead and again, leave that uh, for you there in the chat if you want to go ahead and check us out there. So with that, take care, take it easy, enjoy the rest of your Friday, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you guys next week. Bye-bye.